Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. All rise. The Honorable Inquiry Panel Chairman, Commissioner Roberto Eugenio T. Cadiz, still presiding. Please be seated. Attorney Tricia, do you have any announcement? Uh, uh, no, or are we proceeding already? Um, Your Honor, we will be we will proceeding. All right. Uh, councils, uh, are you ready to present your next witness? Yes, Your Honor, and good afternoon again, good afternoon. Uh, Commissioners. We would like to call our first witness for this afternoon, Dr. Mujikiwis D. Santos. Dr. Santos. May we have our, our legal... Uh uh, person to swear in the witness, Attorney Jose at La Cruz. Please swear in the witness. Uh, counsel, you may now examine your witness. Present your, your honors, Dr. Santos is scientist level two of the national or from and working with the national fisheries research and development institute as its focal person and uh, or let me correct that he is that focal person for the bureau of fisheries and aquatic resources adaptation and mitigation initiative in agriculture he is being presented to share his uh, to share information on the impacts of climate change on the fisheries sector. May I proceed with preliminary questions, uh, sir. Please proceed. We received your honors. One document from Dr. Santos via email, and it is entitled Curriculum Vitae of Mujikiwis D. Santos, consisting of 43 pages, and uh, bearing a signature of the same name, which document was pre marked on 21st of May 2018 as Exhibit EEE to EEE-42 and specifically on the signature as Exhibit EEE-42-A. Uh, do you confirm that, uh, Attorney Esguera? Yeah. All right, proceed, Council. We have additional documents, though, Your Honor, that we would like to present here. And uh, they were remarked just a few minutes ago in preparation for this presentation. And these documents, if I may just enumerate, these are one, the statement of Mujikiwis D. Santos, consisting of one page, and pre-marked as Exhibit FFFF with a signature of the same name as FFFF-A. 
Another document is the PowerPoint presentation of Mujikiwis de Santos, consisting of 14 pages. We marked a few minutes ago as GGGG to GGGG-13. Next is Officiary's Vulnerability Assessment Tool, authored by Angela Aguila and Mujikiwi Santos, consisting of 32 pages. Remarked as Exhibit HHHH to HHHH-31. Another document, Department of Agriculture Climate Change, R&D, 2016-2022, to authored by Dr. Maripaz Perez, Dr. Laura David, Dr. Mujikiwi Santos et al., consisting of 15 pages. Remarked as one, rather as IIII to IIII-14. Next is the possible effects of El Nino on some Philippine marine fisheries resources by Amor Damata II and Mujikiwi Santos, published in Philippine Journal of Science, dated September 2016, consisting of 13 pages, remarked as Exhibit JJJJ to JJJJ-12. And last is the document entitled Development and Application of the Fisheries Vulnerability Assessment Tool, enclosed in parentheses fish wool, to tuna and sardine sectors in the Philippines by Mel Melchor Jacinto, Mujikiwi Santos, et al., consisting of eight pages, remarked as exhibit KKKK to KKKK-7. For your confirmation uh, with, uh, through uh, Attorney Martin, your honors. All right, uh, remarking, uh the exhibits have been has been confirmed so you may now proceed to uh, present your witness yes your honors um we just would like to ask uh, dr santos if uh, he would confirm and affirm the contents of all the documents that i just recited as well as the delivery of those documents yesterday and today this morning Dr. Santos, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Santos. We are now ready to hear your presentation. Okay. Um, good afternoon, Your Honors, um, and ladies and gentlemen. Um, well, first of all, I'm here uh, as a resource person on uh, invitation and uh, as uh, instructed by BFAR management to, to present today about uh, our work on, on climate change and fisheries. Uh, first slide, please. Okay, as mentioned, I'm uh, currently a career scientist too at the National Fisheries Research and Development Institute. NFRDI is the research arm of uh, the Bureau of Fisheries and Aquatic Resources as per Republic Act 8550. And as a focal person of the BIFAR uh, AMIA um, program. And I'll be presenting um, the impacts of climate change on Philippine fisheries. Uh, but before I go into that, I uh, please allow me to to share um, some some insights on what is the status of the, the the fisheries resources right now in the Philippines to sort of contextualize uh, my talk uh, when we do uh, go into the part where we are going to talk about climate change. Okay, next slide. Well, um, the Philippine fisheries is among the world's top. Um, FAO has been. Uh, documenting this, that we are one of the top fish producing countries in the world. Uh, palagi po tayong nasa top 10, although recently nasa top 12 na lang yata. We are the third largest producer of seaweeds. Uh, about uh, three years ago, actually, we're the second largest producer, but now nasa third. Second is uh, Indonesia. We have the fifth longest coastline in the world. We're one of the few distant water fishing nations. Uh, those DWFNS uh, are very few. These are countries which can fish in international waters. And our large commercial fishing fleets can do that. In fact, we're in international waters right now, fishing. 
and contribution uh, to GDP is about 150 billion, although it, this might be a little bit underestimated. Next. Um, just recently, last year, there was a paper that was published by Asansa et al. evaluating the Philippine marine resources. And conservatively, they said that uh, the monetary value of our marine resources is almost about a, a trillion dollars or 966.6 billion US dollars. So, um, marami, pa ta marami po tayong benefit na makukuha in terms of economic benefit from our marine resources. Next. And uh, as of today, uh, uh, under the Municipal Fisheries Fisher Folk Registration System or Fish R of PFAR, uh, there, there are um, 1.9 million um, uh, fisher folks registered in BFAR right now. 1.9 million. Okay. Unfortunately, uh, those are all good and great, but unfortunately, um, we are also beset with a, a lot of uh, 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 threats and, and challenges. One would be, if you see this, this graph, yung pung pula, the red one, is actually the ratio of catch uh, per unit of effort or yung, yung uh, manner po ng pang isda. And as you uh, uh, simply saying, we're saying, we're, what, what this graph is, is saying is yung share ng nung isda, nung, nung, nung share ng huli ng manging isda po. Uh, from the 1950s up to the 2000, if you can see, it's, it's declining. Um, and, and the population growth is that green line there. I, I, don't, I think I don't need to expound the, what, what, the disparity on this one and where we're heading. Next, um, and uh, um, the, the status of the fisheries, uh, um, there are a lot of um, studies already showing that even in the early 1980s that um, there are some, some crises involved already. Like for example, we, we submitted a report to the Convention on Biological Diversity in 2009 that 10 out of 13 major fishing grounds in the country are overexploited. Next. Um, uh, a while ago, this morning, there were a lot of interest and talk about Manila Bay. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, uh, we were actually tasked by the Supreme Court Mandamus, NFRDI, to do the fisheries resources and ecological assessment of Manila Bay. So yun po yung, yung uh, assignment namin sa Mandamus. We don't do the management, we do the the, the, are the, the research on, on the status of the, the bay. And as you can see in that graph, uh, and actually this corroborates uh, what uh, Ka Pablo has mentioned in Manila Bay, is that based on 1947 baseline, um, mind you po, uh, this was a time na nandito po yung mga America, Warfel and Manacop po ang nag-troll uh, survey. And this has been repeated by different scientists. And up to now, we... And, uh, and to this day, we also repeated that uh, methodology. Ito po, uh, based on 1940 baseline of uh, about 4.8 tons per square kilometers, eh, it's around uh, point, can I read, point 0.4, meaning we've, we've decimated the, pop, the biomass, the mersal uh, fishes, meaning yung mga isda po nasa, nasa ilalim. We've decimated the, the, the mersal biomass of fishes in Manila by, by, by about 90%. So 10% na lang po yung nakikita natin right now. Um, and as you can see in the lower graph, yung po uh, kulay red, that's, that's the species composition. Meaning ito po yung klase ng isda na nahuhuli sa Manila Bay. And if you can see, there's a lot of species being caught in Manila Bay during that time in the 1940s. But right now, karamihan ano na lang po, sardinas, minsan may galunggong, minsan may hasa-hasa. Pero masyado ng iba yung, yung species composition. Okay. And uh, if I may add, one of the things that we, we've uh, actually we published this book already, um, uh, one of the things that we, we did see, uh, um, one of course, there's the, the issue of overfishing and, and some illegal fishing there. Pero isa pong malaking nakita namin is yung pollution as a cause of the decimation of of, of Manila Bay because uh, there, there is initial evidence to say that biologically dead na po yung ilalim ng Manila Bay. So it cannot support life anymore. So, um, next slide. Uh, the catch per fisher as per data, again, this corroborates what uh, Ka uh, 
um, the, the resource person this morning said that uh, yung huli po ng manging isda, paunti na po ng paunti. Uh, they, they fish uh, farther, they fish longer, but they catch uh, a lot fewer fish than compared 20, 30, 40 years ago. So kahit sino pong manging isda na kausapin nyo. You know, we, we don't need rocket science to say that really uh, there's there's problem in our uh, fisheries. Next. Uh, the Philippines is also said to be the epicenter of marine biodiversity in the world, meaning we have the highest number of marine organisms per square area sa buong mundo. We, we, we are called the, the, uh, the, the, we are the counterpart of the Amazon forest in terms of, of diversity. And this has been uh, published in 2004 by Ken Carpenter. This has been proven by uh, a number of studies after that. You can see in, in that uh, figure over there. The red one is stating that we have the highest number of organisms. That's the good news. Next is, the, of course, the bad news. Is, uh, a lot of these species are under threat. Uh, corals are degraded state. Seaweeds, we're losing out to Indonesia because we cannot get a lot of propagules already. Um, seagrass are heavily stressed. We're, we're, uh, mangroves, you know how, how many mangrove uh, areas we have. Invertebrates, ito po yung mga shells. No? Yung mga demersal fishes, ito yung mga lapu-lapu. Yung mga small pelagic fishes, ito po yung mga sardines and galunggong. Lahat po yan on the declining trend. Kaya po kabi-kabila yung ating pagsasara ng fishing to, to, to sustain this. Sharks and rays, uh, a lot of species are being uh, now uh, listed under CITES appendices because they are already declared as endangered. Marine turtles and marine mammals have been uh, established already as endangered long time ago. Kaya fully protected na po sila. And, we're, and, and even uh, international journals are saying the Philippines is one of the hottest, hot, hottest of the hotspots in terms of um, uh, threats uh, and, and endemism. Next. Um, and uh, I think this this is, uh, this scenario is not only in the Philippines, but actually it's happening in, in the whole world. Uh, uh, Daniel Pauli, one of the leading fisheries uh, experts in the world, uh, they published a paper in Nature saying that, because uh, before po nitong publication, FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization, saying that the catch production of the world is plateauing as a straight line. When they recomputed with new data, new new evidence, they said that the fisheries of the world peaked in the 1980s and it's rapidly declining. Um, uh, that's the data. And he, he said, although this is controversial, but by, by 2050, if we don't do anything drastic about taking care of our fisheries, the fisheries of the world will collapse by 2050. Okay, next. Now, as I said, uh, many of, of, of what I've shown actually have been happening before, uh, uh, historically, 1950s. No po. So, uh, meaning a lot of threats are already in, in, in for, uh, to, uh, happening to, to Philippine fisheries. Uh, we have illegal, unreported, un unregulated fishing. Uh, we have problems of overfishing, habitat degradation, meaning we, we, we pinapaputukan po natin yung mga reef areas, Reclamation, Kabi Kabila, pollution, as we've seen in Manila Bay. Uh, I mean, how do you revive a, a bay where the, the, the bottom is already dead? So I, I, I don't know how. They ask me how. I, I don't know. And then there's an issue of invasive species. Baka hindi niyo po po alam, may tilapia na po sa Manila Bay. We did not introduce that. It just came out. It's the Sarotero. Si Arroyo, yung meron po nila dito. Uh, it's an invasive species. It, it just came out around five years ago, and it's sort of wreaking havoc to the fish pond operators in, in the area. Kinakain, kinakain po siya. Kaya lang, uh, kumakain din po siya ng maliliit na mga fingerlings. And, and of course, and, and part of what we've seen, uh, by the way, this is the publication that we, we uh, developed and published uh, during the UNDP uh, Sulu Celebrity Project. It's a regional uh, strategic action plan uh, by Indonesia, Malaysia, and Philippines. And there was uh, a consensus that these are the threats to, uh, Philippi, uh, to the fisheries of, of the region. 
And uh, as you may see there, uh, the final one is climate change. Uh, and uh, if I may, a while ago, we were uh, talking uh, there at the Facebook Live. Uh, if I may, um, these things, yung pong iliga, yung IUU fishing, overfishing, habitat degradation, pollution, invasive species, has been, hap ha has been happening. Um, kumbaga, ito po yung uric acid, ito po yung high blood, ito po yung yung mga bagay na uh, tinatry po natin sagutin. And then suddenly, very recently, malalaman natin meron po tayong cancer dahil may climate change. So meron pong multiplier effect. Uh, and um, sa totoo po ang status po ng, ng Philippine fisheries is very complicated. So next. Uh, going now to, to climate change and Philippine fisheries, well, the, the, uh, the Philippines uh, is, has been... Uh, Palagi po tayong nasa honor roll in terms of vulnerability sa climate change. Palagi po tayong nasa top 10. Uh, any index you, you, would, you would visit in terms of uh, comparing countries and their vulnerability to climate change is Philippines always in the top 10. Uh, why? Because I think one, se about 70% of our people lives in coastal areas. And alam po natin that the climate change should impact some climate change. Mauna sa coastal areas, storm surges, typhoons. Um, about 70% of our protein requirement comes from fish. Um, the status of the fisheries is declining. And now you, 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 you put in low levels of socioeconomic capacities of, of many of our coastal communities. Kaya talaga pong very vulnerable yung, 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 yung Pilipinas, lalong lalo na po yung fishery sector and yung coastal communities. Next. And 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 has been also said that and may studies po actually ito hindi po ito uh, parang binanggit lang ni ka Pablo kanina that the Filipino fisher folks are considered poorest of the poor in our communities. Sabi nga nila mas mas mahirap pa daw po sila dun sa nangangalakan. Nagbabakal bote. Mas mahirap pa sila doon kasi once they don't have any more sources of, of, of food and livelihood, wala na silang ibang kukunin. And climate change uh, I guess, especially in the Philippines, may may may, may counting recognition na uh, even with, with Philippine media. So may uh, awareness in, in that sense. Uh, na babanggit yung Philippine fisheries and climate change. And uh, next. And uh, in fact, what I'm saying is that there is actually already recognition on our part that uh, we need to address climate change issues. Uh, in, in our case. Um, Hindi, non, non issue na po yung uh, is, is climate change occurring or not. Uh, um, I think in, in our case, it's we're already sort of looking at it and preparing for it. Um, even uh, the fisheries industry plan, for example, nakalagay po yung mga strategies na dyan on how to address uh, the impacts of, of climate change. Next. Um, such that even um, in, in our official uh, organizational uh, plans and organ organizational mandates. Uh, the BIFAR has already mainstreamed its climate change disaster risk reduction management strategic framework. Um, pinagsama na po namin yung CC and the RRM. We, we sort of, and ang, ang, uh, the, the basis of this one came from, of course, the, the fishery plan. And of, of course, uh, that because of our climate change law and our DRRM law. Uh, and so this is uh, our means of of trying to address climate change issues. Next slide. And as you can see, uh, this is the strategic framework. Uh, uh, in terms of climate change, we are in the mitigation and prevention part. This is where we do studies so that uh, if and when uh, the effects of climate change would translate into disasters, we will know what to do. And so in this part, we, and especially in our case as, as a research institution, we're trying to help in terms of understanding uh, the, the the effects and is it, is it happening uh, where when how many etc cetera, etc cetera. so that we can help out in terms of planning for that strategic firm framework that BFAR would be able to implement on the ground. Next, um, and I would like to start with with this one by by 2010. Actually, uh, there are there has been already predictions on what will happen to, to uh, the fisheries if uh, climate change and its uh, impacts would, would occur. Um, na predict na po yun na may warming, may sea, sea level rise, 
may may um, water uh, salt water intrusion, and a lot of those are 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 sort of uh, symptoms of climate change uh, or, or the defects of climate change. Um, yun po yung ating actually uh, inaaral at binabantayan. And uh, on the lower part, uh, there is a prediction that there are um, extreme weather events that will 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 happen. Meaning, an ano ba yung mga nababanggit? Uh, fewer storms pero super super typhoon ang, ang levels. Um, and one thing is yung there will be increase in in El Nino events. Increase in El Nino events in, and uh, increase in the intensity of El Nino events. Yun po yung yung prediction na will, that will uh, be brought about by climate change. Okay, and in our case, um, we, we did not, uh, we're not looking at the warming to correlate with fissures not yet, salt water intrusion. In our case, we zero in on the effects of El Nino because this one we're, we're trying to monitor at the Department of Agriculture. So next. So that's why we, we've started uh, trying to understand the possible effects of El Nino, again, as a function of climate change. Kung dumami yan at mas malalakas, then affected tayo. And we can sort of measure that. And based on this review, we, we say that sa mga plankton, napag-usapan po kanina yung red tide, uh, it has been predicted that red tide occurrences will increase due to climate change and El Nino, uh, increase in El Nino events. Um, in terms of uh, the resources themselves, like the sardines and galunggong, uh, there will be displacement in terms of distribution. Kasi po kung mainit na dito, pupunta po sila dun sa mas malamig na mas conducive sa kanila. So, eh, dahil po migratory sila, they, they will migrate elsewhere. Um, so may displacement. And then there will be some fish kills that will happen because of changing temperatures. Um, and then, there, of course, there's lesser available uh, food. Corals, uh, bleaching will occur uh, because of El Nino events dahil nga ma mainit po ang tubig. Uh, seaweeds, magkakaroon po ng again, uh, sakit, no? Uh, yun po yung mga predictions. And marine mammals, even in whales and dolphins, will have to move elsewhere uh, because it's not conducive anymore. Um, so, so mara may maraming pong effect siya. Next. And so in our case, uh, we looked at whether these predictions uh, could happen or is it happening in, in the Philippines. In 1997, this, there's the one big uh, El Nino event. And uh, Lehodi et al. published in Nature that the tunas, the, sa, sa taas po ng graph, yung dots na yon ay yung concentration ng tunas where they are located. Uh, they got this data from uh, fishing companies because may actual uh, location po yun. Kung mapapansin nyo, under normal conditions, nandito po sa may malapit-lapit na ng konti sa Pilipinas. But by the time El Nino struck in 1997, Tingnan niyo po yung dots kung nasaan na yung, yung mga tuna. Medyo lumayo na. Now that's a big problem. How can we now access tuna resources there when it's so far? Uh, baka sa gasolina pa lang po eh, hindi na kaya. So, so this, this happened uh, already when, when El Nino struck in 1997. So pwede po bang mangyari yun pag tumaas yung temperature ng tubig? I think I think so. We think so because it already happened during an El Nino event. Next, uh, uh, may 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 concept, may may thinking po na yung mga fish pond na mga nasa isda, yung mga isda na nasa fish pond hindi daw kumapektuhan. It's because they will just swim under kung mainit na yung sea surface. Uh, but unfortunately, in the El Nino of 2010, nagkaroon po ng fish kills sa Magat Dam. Uh, it's basically because Lumangoy nga pababa yung isda, naubos naman yung tubig. <laughs> Kasi nawala na pong, wala, drought eh, and ninyo eh. So, hindi na rin po nakalaya, ka, na, nawala na rin sila ng dissolved oxygen, pulang na yung tubig, crap na sila doon, so namatay na sila. So, it can happen, yung, yung ano, uh, ganitong klaseng scenario po for, for uh, inland uh, fisheries. Next. Uh, this one is an ongoing study where, where fortunately, we were asked by uh, then Director Asis to look at Bangus Fry, Bangus Fry assessment collection. Alam niyo po yung nag, nag yun po yun, uh, that person, nag sumusud sud siya. Siya po yung nangongolekta ng Bangus Fry. And those Bangus Fry are used to, 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 to be sold to grow out para palakihin po ng, ng Bangus na malalaki sa grow out. 
So meron po tayong mga kababayan na ang livelihood nila is on that. And uh, in 2015, we started monitoring that. We saw that during summer, lumilitaw po yung bangus fry, nawawala po yung ibang species. Uh, pero noong 2016, nagkaroon ng El Nino, tumaas yung temperature doon. Parang hindi na po bumalik yung bangus. Uh, puro bycatch na ang alam. Although this one, we needed to to stretch for the study, but um, in, in that information, we, 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 we think that the temperature, increase in temperature, would have an effect in this uh, in this fry fishery that many of the fisher folk are, are uh, uh, depending upon. So, kung wala na pong bangus fry, ano po po pong kukunin nila? Wala na. Next. And uh, just this one, uh, we also started uh, looking at whether traditionally people has been doing some um, adaptation to, to climate and climate variabilities. And we found out that, for example, in Batanes, um, may mga traditional practices sila in the hopes that we will be able to get experiences from this, this one that we can use to help out in, in other areas. Next. And, uh, and uh, this one, we're, we're actually have, uh, conducting this, what we call vulnerability assessments for, um, of, of uh, the different sectors in the fisheries uh, in terms of uh, climate change impacts. Next. So what we did, we, we developed a tool which we call Fish Bowl, um, uh, which we published in a fisheries research. Uh, it's an international uh, peer-reviewed journal. Um, um, and apply this this tool to the sardines and and uh, tuna sectors in, down south. Basically, it's uh, we follow the model of trying to measure uh, exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity to come up with the vulnerability of the communities. This is an IPCC framework. And so, what we found out in this paper is that the, the tuna and the sardine sector, although many of them are commercial in scale, they're actually uh, me medium yung kanilang vulnerability. Uh, and I will tell you why later on. Medium yung vulnerability na not low. Next. Um, and and uh, in, in this one, I'm uh, just showing you mga rubrics. Uh, I'll not dwell into that. The, the parameters that we tried to score during the interviews. Alam nyo naman po kasi kailangan medyo scientific. So we had some measures, one to five, etc. And uh, next. And what we've... Uh, and, and we conducted this one, um, um, although at the initial phase, together with the help of BIFAR regional offices, and see wh which areas are uh, uh, vulnerable to climate change in terms of the tuna fishers, for example. And as you can see, uh, some areas are have low vulnerability and some are high uh, medium vulnerabilities. What this is saying is that actually in the Philippines, it's again, our, our country is very complicated you really have to go down to certain locations. Uh, one location will not have the same character as another. Uh, the north would be different from the south in terms of species, in terms of vulnerabilities, etc. So, but we're trying to, um, to, to analyze that. Next. Uh, I will just give examples. That's the tuna fishery. We, we look at the seaweeds uh, fishery here. Um, and uh, as, an, as, a, as a summary, uh, what we found out is that many of those communities that have medium uh, vulnerabilities, uh, ang ito po yung mga nakita namin nakapull down ng kanilang score. This yung annual income, uh, that would be one, uh, very low yung kanilang score. Na in terms of adaptive capacity, uh, wala pong masyadong income. Uh, uh, the organizations that support climate change based on their perception, kulang. Access to information. Um, and then uh, adaptive strategy, uh, precautionary measures. Now, um, these things are uh, uh, is, is telling us that uh, ito yung mga bagay if we want to help them. Uh, these, these are the areas that we can uh, support so that we can uh, uh, better their, their uh, vulnerability index in a way. Hindi na siya medium kung hindi low na lang kasi uh, well-informed sila, ready silang magplano, etc. And one thing that we see, uh, really, Filipinos are very resilient. Um, you, you just give them the, the tools to be able to really uh, um, blossom in a way. And then, then they will take care of themselves. Next. Um, I guess that's it. Uh, um, that's final slides. Um, in our case, hindi po kami tumitigil in government to 
to to see uh, we know what to do we know how how to do it in fact it's written here based on our climate change r d extension agenda of the things that we need to develop i guess the the, the question now is actually um, um, uh, who who will implement these things uh, we need more people in terms of trying to help out in, in doing these things so with that your honors uh, thank you very much Uh, excuse me, Council. Before you proceed, I noticed that the that this exhibit uh, 4G uh, consisting of 13 pages is or 14 uh, does not have the same number of pages that were just put on the screen. There, I think there were three more pages slides that are not here. Uh, could you please update the the panel with? And then maybe we can, uh, yeah, the, the, the series marking will also change. But uh, three pages, I think, were, were not included in the exhibit. That's a correct observation, Your Honor. And uh, may we request Dr. Santos to explain the update that he made this morning? Um, um. Um, actually, it's my fault. Uh, usually, when when you prepare slides, um, until the last minute, you would want to check and recheck and, and revise. So I, I had to put some slides there, specifically the the valuation report and uh, the number of uh, fisher folk registered. I think that was really important to be included there. So my, my fault. No, no, no problem. Uh, we just want to be updated, no? Because the the one presented by you now is different from the one that the smart team exhibit. Please proceed. May we proceed now, Your Honor, with some clarificatory questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Santos, for that enlightening presentation. You mentioned earlier that uh, El Nino is affected by climate change and red tide is basically caused or that climate change significantly contributed to the occurrences of red tide. Can you explain a little bit more about this incident? Well, um, I, I think a lot of uh, uh, experts already talked about the, con the, the climate change as what is it. Uh, and it's, uh, I guess basically it's the increase in greenhouse gases so that the, the earth is warming. And the, the warming of the earth, kumbaga siya po, yun po yung sakit. And dahil sakit yan, meron siyang symptoms. And the symptoms are actually these things where you there is increase in temperature in the surface water, there will be increase in typhoons, and there will be increase in El Nino events. And when you increase El Nino events, um, studies are saying that um, a lot of things can, can happen because of the warming of the, uh, of the area. So there's drought and there's increased uh, occurrence of red tides. Um, and increase uh, flooding. Oh, no, no, not flooding. That's La Nina. Increased drought. So. Thank you. You mentioned earlier that uh, some are predictions. And to clarify the, the predictions from what is actually happening now, can you explain if the impacts that you shared are already happening or are they predicted? Yes, ma'am. Um, um, there were I, I've I've uh, shown uh, uh, some some publications where they predicted that these are the things that would happen if, if climate change would occur, and uh, the reason why I zeroed in on El Nino is because those are the things that you can measure. Um, the the warming or sea increase in sea sea level rise or increase in sea surface surface temperature you would require uh, decades or Hundred year data to have some co clean correlation whether that would be that the effect of that would be this this kind of work. So that what uh, what we tried to do is look at El Nino because El Nino there's a spike in increase in in temperature and there's a, there's increase in drought. So that one we can actually measure in in a shorter period of time. We don't need like a hundred years data to correlate. So, and what we've seen in the El Nino events, 
there's displacement of, of, of fishes. Um, there's uh, uh, disappearance of larvae of bangus in, in some areas. Uh, there's uh, increase in, in, in occurrences of uh, red tides. At least some of the publications have, have shown that. And 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 increase in drought that that would occur uh, that would affect uh, uh, fish kills in in certain uh, inland bodies of water like a dam or a fish pond. So yes, ma'am. Thank you. I'll pick up the description you made earlier uh, on climate change that it has a multiplier effect. So can you clarify what is that multiplier effect or how does it multiply the effects uh, in relation to what you described as additional threats of climate change or the threats that climate change pose, pose, poses to fishery sector in particular? Yes, ma'am. As, as I mentioned a while ago, um, parang meron ka ng sakit na inaalagaan and then suddenly you discovered that you know, cancer. Um, because the, the, the fisheries uh, is, is beset with, with a lot of issues already, problems, um, overfishing. In fact, uh, 1980s, pa, pinababawasan na yung ating fishing effort ng mga scientists. Um, so um, a lot of these are, have been occurring, uh, habitat degradation, the issues that's being mentioned by ka, uh, Pablo Canina. These are all been, is, is happening. And I do believe uh, that, uh, for me, the, 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 the symptoms or the effect of climate change, uh, actually, pinipredict nila will be uh, mararamdaman pa lang in, in 2050 or 2100. Uh, so therefore, the, the, the symptoms of that climate change is uh, relatively recent, supposed to be, in the 1950s. So what I'm saying is that because the fisheries already had a lot of issues already, and then now comes climate change. Would, for example, wala na ngang mahuling tuna uh, yung, yung mga tao because na deplete na. And then it comes increase in sea surface temperature, and then the, those remaining tuna will, will go to Canada. Then what is left of us? It's, it's, uh, it's really, uh, I don't want to think about what will happen in the near future but uh so it's it's yeah there's this there's this multiplier effect uh, again parang may, may sakit na uh, then maka-discover ka pa na meron ka pang isa pang sakit uh, which is really nakakalor so you are saying dr santos that climate change multiplies the effects the bad effects of illegal fishing overfishing and uh, other problems like pollution and things like that. Yes, ma'am. It can potentially add to those problems. Thank you, Dr. Seth. That is all for now, uh, Honorable Commissioners. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Witness. Uh, uh, Commissioner Armamento, we'll have some questions for you. Dr. Uh, Dr. Santos, I have testified earlier that one of the reasons of our vulnerabilities to climate change is because most of our people are living along the shoreline. Uh, but may I know if there is any uh, specific or particular geographic factor that makes us more vulnerable as compared to other uh, nations insofar as climate change is concerned? Y yes, ma'am. The, the, the vulnerability, um, one would... would um, uh, uh, one thing that would add to that would be, of course, our location. And uh, um, by, by, by culture, our, we are a fish-eating country. So, may tendency po talaga doon sila mag, magstay sa, sa tabi ng dagat. And, uh, um, and in addition to that, there, we, uh, because the vulnerability is measured not only of the status of the resource and the location, but also your, your capacity to adapt. And and because the uh, poorest of the poor are in these coastal areas, so that talagang medyo mataas yung kanilang vulnerability as compared to other countries where uh, makakabili po sila ng aircon anytime, makamove sila to another place where because they have money. So I guess in that aspect, uh, that's why comparatively we are more vulnerable than the other countries. Follow-up questions. 
is our being an archipelago um, makes us more vulnerable than the land ma uh, countries that are in the land mass? Um, yes, ma'am. Uh, it's because we're we're subjected to already to the elements, uh, storm surges, typhoons, etc. So in in that aspect, uh, there's already a, sort of a, a minus in terms of how how we, we cope up with this with, with this one. Uh, although Filipinos are, are resilient, na banggit nga ng mga fishermen, um, actually they like being in the coastal areas. Uh, it's just so happened, I guess, uh, if they have the, the capacities to to adapt, uh, income for example or, or means, I think they they'll be able to do that. But right now, based on our assessment, uh, vulnerable po sila because of the lack of capacities. Plus, added to that, that they are living in in areas where there's they're prone to natural disasters. Hello, Doctor. Are we still uh, considered the epicenter of marine biodiversity in the world? So we're still maintaining that. We're still number one. Uh, based on uh, very recent publications, ma'am, uh, yes, we are. Although there are some scientists uh, uh, who are working in Indonesia, trying to contest that Indonesia is also the center of marine biodiversity. But um, based on the studies uh, that has been published, I, I would like to, I, I'm more inclined to, not that I'm biased, but I'm more inclined to say that the, the, the country is the center of marine biodiversity. Just in our fish market survey, we've been discovering new species of fish wow. that are being sold in the market as, as we speak. Oh. So, so would you say would you say that uh, climate change in effect has not really impacted that much our uh, marine um, world? I mean, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's that's a good good point, ma'am. But uh, I think we we need to to look at the baselines uh, okay. because the baselines the baseline so is moving. Yeah. So me meaning. Um, the, the center of marine biodiversity was was sort of published uh, based on data that we have right now compared to the data that other countries have. But whether uh, 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 time series wise, meaning historically is the case, there's a possibility that actually we're more diverse than we are right now. Now, yes, before. Uh, case in point, for example, Manila Bay, Again, we've decimated 90% of, of population in Manila Bay. And we, we, we think many of those species, uh, actually, I'm sure they were, not, they, were not be, they were not described, but they were already decimated. So uh, I, I guess in that case, uh, um, climate change would have an effect on, on the biodiversity uh, if you look at the, but you, historical. Did, but you did say that there are more actually species, new species that have been discovered. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay. It, so uh, how would you explain that in terms uh, of... Uh, it, it just changing. goes to show, ma'am, that uh, our country is really diverse. That even with, with, with these impacts, even with these threats, in fact, uh, science is saying that around 50% uh, of the species in, in the world are... are are, are getting extinct without us knowing them. Um, so I think it's that's the case. We're just really endowed with a lot of species. But when, if we can maybe have a time machine and go back like 50 years ago, I would think we will have a more number of species uh, that we have as uh, right now. So you're not you're not actually saying that our environment, you know, marine environment, is actually healthy. To attract so many diverse uh, fishery uh, fishes or marine um, marine uh, what is it? organisms, marine yeah organisms uh, that, that they would come to our country because uh, the environment there is actually okay and healthy. Um, well, there there are hypotheses from why um, again uh, that that statement that. Uh, we are the epicenter of marine biodiversity. It's not in reference to now compared to before. It's reference to what is be what has been actually described from from other countries. 
Okay, so you compared with other countries, saying that we have a lot more species compared to other countries. But again, uh, there's a big possibility that um, actually when we look back and if we were able to study uh, the, the species uh, in more detail, we will have a lot more. So that when we arrive right uh, to this date, we already actually decimated a lot of them, become extinct. So, um, yes, ma'am. In terms of diversity, the, the, apparently the country, um, there's some magic in there. There are a, a lot of hypotheses that's being um, put forward to we are the center of, like uh, some scientists are saying that we are the, uh, the cradle of life where species are born in, 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 this, in this country. And then there's this uh, theory of center of overlap, meaning um, species in, in other areas, in the uh, Central Pacific and species in the Atlantic Ocean, for example, are, are, are uh, sort of overlaps in our area. So there are a lot of theories that's saying that uh, the, the, the country is uh, um, really uh, um, why the, the biodiversity of the country is, uh, is very high. Um, but um, we, we don't have any clear explanation yet, uh, evidence for, uh, why is that and why even with these threats, we can still see a, a lot of, a lot of uh, described new species. What is your, uh, when did you first study this? There's the base, when, we, what year can you establish the, the baseline? The first time you ever said that we are the center. The center. Actually, it was not me, ma'am. I mean, yeah, it was, what, it was uh, published in, I uh, uh, forgot the journal, uh, published by uh, Carpenter and Springer. When in was 2000, that? 2004. Okay. So 2004. Since, since 2004 up to now, you're saying that there have been changes. Yes, ma'am. We continue to study species and we, we can still, we can still identify, uh, we can still describe new species. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Santos, so you said that new uh, species are being, being discovered, but at the same time, you're, you also were saying that a lot more species have been lost. All right. And you ascribe this loss to climate change, to a lot of the uh, threats in the fisheries, sir. Uh, which include illegal fishing, dynamite fishing, um, habitat degradation, pollution, and, and now climate change. All right, the symptoms of climate change. Are there other questions? Uh, just on the red tide and the fish kills, uh, I'm sure you have data on, on the frequency and if you say that there are more occurrences, um, uh, could you enlighten us on that? And to what extent is that caused by the factors that you've mentioned earlier? Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm not a red tide person. I, I did not focus on, on studying red tides. But I did see a, a, a paper where they compared red, red tide occurrence uh, in, in the region from, like, I think, uh, um 1960s to 2000 and there was uh, they, they depicted that there was increases in occurrence uh including the philippines in terms of red tide occurrence now but particularly on on uh, manila bay for example um well, I, I don't have any sort of specific study on that uh, i think bfar is monitoring that but i don't have the uh, information right now um the, the funny thing is, I, I, I do also know that um, uh, it's kind of crazy because actually b before po, the, 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 the cause of red tide is pyrodinium, if I'm not mistaken. Pyrodinium ba, mense. But now, scientists are saying we don't see pyrodinium anymore. We're seeing a different kind of species of bloom. So, um, so the thing is... There's a lot more things needed to be done to understand what's really happening. The problem with, with uh, studying uh, studying ecosystems in the wild is it's, it's, it's very, uh, actually, you cannot predict things. That's why you need 100 uh, years of data to, to make certain some patterns. 
because there's certain interannual variabilities na hindi po parang two years, three years lang actually, pero actually natural occurrence var- variabilities. We need 100 years data to, to show talagang nag- nag-increase. And unfortunately, sa, 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 sa atin, uh, ulang po yung information. Father Walpole? Just, I think, to clarify um, this, um, red tide is primarily due to eutrophication of the waters and pollution from often runoff from the land or waste disposal in the rivers. Um, now, maybe water temperature might enable that to some degree. But yes, in Philippine waters, red tide has been on the increase, and that's shown and proven uh, in terms of it's very clear waste effluent going into the seas. Um, so uh, we've, we've got to uh, keep that distinction. Um, the other is, is that the way scientific uh, procedure goes and with the technologies we have today we're able to as it were dredge deeper and go further and find new species that have been there all the time these species are here both because of the um, tropical dynamics of where we are and how the his we're including in that a lot of the corals etc and how the plates have moved so um, there's a fair understanding of what's there. Now, to try to ask how climate change is impacting that, plus um, one, two, three, four, five other factors you have here, I, I think it's very important to try to see, is there any methodology that can illustrate the multiplier effect of climate change. Because that's like our earlier witnesses today. You know, we problem one, two, three, four, and then we have climate change, which makes everything worse. worse. Yeah. So I don't know if there's uh, any studies ongoing that help explain this multiplier effect. Uh, yes, sir. Um- uh, for for the red tide, yes, actually, uh, pollution and eutrophication can uh, can can contribute to certain blooms. Although there are, I think, some publications where they try to correlate uh, El Nino events, not not climate change per se, but El Nino events in the occurrence of of uh, red tides. That's what I'm saying. Um, and then um, with regards to multiplier effect. Uh, I don't know, maybe some other scientists or some other groups would, would be able to do that. It's, it's really difficult. Uh, since 2010, they've been asking us, is it overfishing or climate change? Um, we, we, we haven't really answered that uh, methodology-wise. The thing is, climate change, you know, it's, it's very new, uh, very new to all of us. And everybody's just starting to try to understand and develop models on this one. And so... Uh, I'm not sure if there's a methodology to to measure uh, multiplier effect, etc. I hope there is, but right now, sir, I, I don't know any any uh, methodology on that aspect. But it could be good. Thank you. I have a follow-up question. But uh, you were, you were saying that. Uh, it is not yet clear to you whether the, the effect is a direct cause of El Nino or climate change. Whether which of the two factors uh, are affecting uh, the, the the situation in the in in, in uh, yes, sir. Um, we're, well, I, I, we've anchored our studies on El Nino because we measure that, and as a function of climate change, because as predicted. Uh, when you do, uh, when you do have climate change now, uh, you will get all these effects of climate change uh, symptoms. If I, uh, as I've said, 
um, and uh, these are warming uh, seas, etc. And one of the predicted things that will happen is increased in El Nino events, and they will they will be more, and they will be much stronger. Um, and so, um, so um, uh, that's why we looked at uh, El Nino because that's the one where, where we measure, and that's the one we can sort of um, address in the meantime um, as a function of climate change. Um, because for me, um, it, again, it's it's in the Philippines, for example, it's really difficult to correlate uh, increase in in the temperature slowly through 100 years and say that this is uh, this event will cause uh, decrease in uh, stocks of fish. Uh, it's kind of difficult that way. Um, we need more models, maybe as as father suggests, to 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 see that. Uh, but yeah, in the absence of uh, time series data that long, it's kind of difficult. That's why in our case, we, we, we focus on El Nino because that one we can measure as a function of climate change. Oh, although, uh, if I may answer, actually, um, um, I, I, we, we're going to publish a paper with NOAA uh, looking at the modeled spawning patterns of skipjack and what will happen to skipjack uh, spawning, yung panganganak po if temperatures are increased this 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 based on historical data catch data and what we saw is that it's actually the current uh, cli uh, climate conditions right now with the temperature we see some changes already in the spawning patterns of skipjack and eventually they say they predicted that they will go out of this area um hopefully not but we, we are seeing and we're going to publish that soon we're seeing some changes in the patterns of, of skipjack. And that one, sir, is based on some, some time series information in the region and some modeling. So climate change is uh, causing El Nino. Yes, sir. And El Nino is affecting the spawning patterns of certain uh, marine. Uh, yeah, that spawning, species. sir, is actually um, anchored already, not on El Nino, but anchored already on, on the uh, changes in the temperature already it's already uh the the the, the increase in temperature due to greenhouse emissions uh, so so it, it it's like that so it, it's a little bit different uh the el nino that i i was saying sir for example in the occurrence of fry we saw that it, it did not come uh, come out anymore the fry because of temperature that one is specific for el nino because we only have like two, three years data. But this prediction, uh, this modeling that we're doing in spawning in the skipjack is, is based on already time series data in the region. All right, thank you. Uh, a point to add there. Um, we need to be clear where we're talking of El Nino and Enso because it is tied to a southern oscillation. Um, and while uh, clearly um, climate change will, if you like, aggravate uh, the occurrence of El Nino and probably make it stronger, um, it's not purely a climate change phenomena. It has always occurred. It's just occurring with greater extremity. So scientifically, we refer to this as ENSO. So I think that that's very important to show that there is a, uh, a history and a link of this occurring, but now it's becoming, shall I say, more more aggravated. Uh, that I'd certainly like to find out more about the study uh, of the skipjack, because this is the sort of uh, information that ties uh, yes, climate. the discussion down very clearly. Yes, sir. We'll, we'll, once it's published, we'll, we'll uh, give you a copy of that publication in an international peer review journal. Um, I think, ma'am, it, it already got accepted uh, um, two weeks ago. There's just minor revisions. And then uh, I think it will be out very soon. Maybe in, in, um, in a month's time. I'm going to ask the primary author to give me a PDF copy. Councils, are you redirecting your 
Yes. Not really redirecting, Your Honor, but maybe a, a couple more of uh, clarificatory questions. Uh, Dr. Santos, uh, is it is it cost costly to undertake research or study on identifying specific impacts of climate change on the fisheries and measuring them or quantifying those impacts? Is it costly? Um, well, what what part of the impacts, ma'am? Um, you need you mean the socioeconomic impacts or changes in migration or changes in behavior or reproductive ability? All of them. All of them. Is for, that for the socioeconomic uh, impacts, we we're trying to do them do that right now. In fact, uh, the DA Philippine Development Rural Project. Um, we're just waiting for the, the fund transfer to do a, an extensive vulnerability assessment of, of the communities, the fisher, uh, fishery sector, uh, in terms of, of impacts of climate change uh, to them and how they are ready or something. But for, um, sp but for the specific, um, let's say, whether yung galunggong ba natin eh pupunta sa Vietnam, for example, um, uh, that one, uh, we need we need force data we do have some satellite data there there are some people who are willing to help uh, but i guess um, i think it's it's doable um we need some more investments but i guess i think one thing that uh, I, i'm always saying is that what we need now are more people more expertise more filipinos to go into studying these because sa, sa tuna pa lang ma, hindi ko na kaya. <laughs> Meron pang sardinas, may galunggo. Lahat po nito may iba-ibang kwento. Uh, may iba -iba. So, Tapos yung kwento ng uh, galunggong sa north is different from the kwento ng galunggong sa south, sa east, sa west, sa center. Meron pang Philippine rice. For 40 lang po kami sa NFRDI. 40. Yung iba nasa aquaculture, yung iba nasa post-harvest. So, it, it, Again, it's there needs some investments. We need more expertise, but I think we can do it. A lot, a lot of people outside are willing to help. Uh, it's just a matter of trying to, I guess, operationalize. So you would say that undertaking studies and research to understand the specific impacts on fisheries, the climate change impacts on on the fisheries, is an additional, an additional cost for the agency. Is that correct? Oh yes, ma'am. Definitely, you need more to develop more expertise. You need to get data, for example, satellite data, for example. Uh, we need to get that um, um, data from fishing operators, for example. Um, we need all of these things, and it requires additional investment, of course. So, for your agency in a developing country like the Philippines, it would be an additional expense. Is that right? To, to study effects and impacts of climate change. Yeah, definitely. Because, ma'am, uh, uh, in the, the Department of Agriculture, we are, more, we are on food security. Uh, we, we try to breed fish. We try to close fishing. Um, although we do understand we need to study them under a climate lens already right now. Uh, but definitely, because we don't know much about the impacts of this one, we need to study them. And so, therefore, we need more people doing that um, and and to wrap it up so in your personal opinion do you think those who contributed to climate change must invest on those research and studies well uh, assuming um uh, these people or there are people or industries that that uh cause this whole thing i i i believe they they should be responsible enough to 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 pitch in and and uh, contribute to how how we solve all these problems because they, they were the ones who caused it in the first place. So I, I guess yeah, it's it's just proper that they should chip in chip in more. Um, problem is um, uh, unfortunately the Philippines, although we do emit very little carbon compared to other countries. But actually, we're bearing the brunt of the impacts of climate change because our our vulnerabilities because of of our communities. Uh, so, um, actually, unfair. But but uh, 
what do we do? Uh, we in government, we just do whatever we can to, to help out our our clientele, which is which are the fisher folks. That is all, Your Honors. Thank you very much, Doctor Santos. May he be? Um, that is an additional question because uh, Doctor Santos said that. Uh, uh, I just have an additional question because Dr. Santos, in answer to your query, if uh, the the like the one that has caused climate change, if ever there is one, uh, will uh, be responsible enough to pay for whatever research we conducted. Uh, I want to ask Dr. Santos, as a scientist, uh, what do you think or who do you think caused the climate change? Well, um, there, there's been, as you know, there's there's been debate on whether climate change is occurring or not, right? There, there's still, um, although in, in terms of policy, I think the Philippines is an, an issue because we, we do have a climate change act. So meaning we're, we're, we're preparing for that. Um, and uh, what I've seen uh, is that um, uh, uh, there was, uh, the, the problem that um, the, cli the climate of the world is, is changing through time. There's this up, ups and downs, and apparently there's already strong evidence to show that um, this 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 surge in, in change in, in temperature, for example, is really uh, very quick and and very recent in terms of geologic event, and uh, and and there's evidence to show there's this pinpointing towards the increased emission of these greenhouse gases. So basing on that on that uh, evidence, uh, uh, th there is, uh, uh, we, we think, or I think that uh, really that, that uh, industrialization, that, that, that boost in terms of emission of greenhouse gases um, um, likely to have Cause this increased rapid increase in, in temperature that we're experiencing right now, because it's 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 very different. It, it looks like it's really man-made. Um, if it's not, it should be like geologic times, like thousands of years. But, uh, apparently, it's this one. So that's my personal opinion. Thank you very much, Dr. Santos. May Dr. Santos be excused, Your Honors? All right. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Santos. Uh, I hope you can make yourself available uh, later on again. Should we, should we think that uh, we will need more uh, information or opinion from you? And also, we we would like to remind you and the council to yes, when when the paper that was adverted to earlier is done and released to furnish the commission a copy of the study. Thank you. So we may now proceed to your next witness. Yes, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Um, we we call on our um, fifth witness, Under Secretary Sigfredo Roque Serrano. Can we have a? Under Secretary Serrano uh, has sworn. Uh, Council, you may proceed. Our fifth witness is the Under Secretary for Policy and Planning, Project Development, Research and Regulations of the Department of Agriculture. He was appointed as Undersecretary since 2005 and has been with the Department of Agriculture since 1992. Yusek Serrano also has a postdoctoral de uh, degree in agricultural economics. Your Honor, we are offering the testimony of Yusek Sigredo Serrano to share the impacts of climate change on the agriculture sector. But before we proceed, Your Honor, may we uh, be allowed? to ask preliminary questions with respect to the documents that you and furnish uh, the Honorable Commission and these Council. Please go ahead. 
Good afternoon, Yusek Serrano. Good afternoon, Paul. Yusek Serrano, I have here two documents. First is uh, what appears to be a curriculum the day of Sigfredo Roque Serrano, consisting of three pages. And also the second document, which appears to be a printed PowerPoint presentation entitled Climate Change and Philippine Agriculture by Sigfredo R. Serrano, PhD. I'll be showing you these documents, Dr. Serrano. You, Sig Serrano, do you confirm and affirm uh, the contents of these documents? I do confirm and affirm the contents of the documents. Thank you, Yusek. On your um, curriculum today, on page three thereof, there appears a signature and a date, May 23, 2018. Do you recognize this signature? Yes, most definitely, uh, Council. Yes. Whose signature is that, Mr. Yusek uh, Serrano? This is my signature in my beautiful handwriting. Thank you, Yusek Serrano. Your Honor, for the record, the curriculum detail of Sigfredo Roque Serrano was pre-marked as Exhibit TTT to TTT-2, consisting of three pages. But the signature, which was recently um, signed earlier by Yusek Serrano, we are requesting that this be uh, marked as our Exhibit TTT-2. Dash A. And the other document, Your Honor, was pre marked as Exhibit UUU to UUU 8, consisting of nine pages during the pre marking of exhibits last May 21, Your Honor. With that, Your Honor, um, may, may we proceed? Please proceed. Yusek Serrano, um, can you please um, give, uh, enlighten these uh, honorable commission and the audience with respect to your uh, presentation that you submitted? Uh, yes, Council. Your Honors, uh, this presentation will not be a technical presentation. Uh, I'm going to present it at the, the policy level. Uh, this benefits from the previous testimonies uh, before uh, before this commission on this particular case, including the more recent uh, presentation. Uh, and therefore, I would uh, I would extend uh, on the on what all of those uh, facts and technical data actually mean for our people, but more particularly in the agriculture and fisheries sector. Of course, I'll speak the fisheries part because my colleague from the Bureau of Fisheries and Aquatic uh, uh, Resources has uh, uh, brilliantly elucidated on the details for fisheries. So if I can start, uh, Your Honors, uh, just, uh, just to establish the, the premise of this uh, uh, brief uh, presentation, you will note that we are archipelagic, 7,100 islands and that depends on whether it's high tide or low tide uh, and therefore in, 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 we are in the west pacific that means also that uh, if you look at this kind of a geographical uh, factor for the philippines uh, that that also partially answers your question on why so many people are vulnerable to climate change it's because we are an island nation we are a archipelagic and most of our people are actually in the coastline. A substantial proportion of the population would be in the coastlines. Uh, let me also describe the Philippines as uh, being the jewel of the Pacific Ring of Fire and being the buckle of the Typhoon Belt. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a very nice distinction, but that aptly uh, puts the, how I would describe the Philippines in terms of weather, disaster, etc. And of course, we are a very prolific people. We have more than a million in terms of population. 
But uh, I would tell you later, Your Honors, that while the population growth and the number of our people uh, seems to be the problem of many among us, I would tell you that it should not be a problem at all. And that we could look at our people differently from how we view uh, the Filipino people. Uh, recently, from the past administration and this current administration, we have relatively high economic growth, but it's also a fact that we still have very high poverty rates. Uh, inclusivity uh, still uh, is a appears to be an elusive target that I think this administration is trying very hard uh, to, to attain. Uh, but I tell you that uh, you might not have known it, but the poverty rate in the rural areas is actually higher than the urban areas, which is quite ironic because that's where all of the food, that's where the, the base of the economy would be. And yet, uh, something like 40%, I think the last figure I saw was 43%. It is it is quite uh, it's quite tragic that more people are poor and more pe more hungry people can be found in the rural areas. We are no longer a predominantly rural people. About 40% of the population is now considered rural, and agriculture now contributes only less than 10% of the gross domestic product of this country. Next. Uh, in terms of uh, resources, uh, we have something like 10 million hectares out of something like 30 million hectares uh, of the land uh, area of the Philippines. Some say it's now different because uh, the more precise uh, uh, imaging and satellite image, we would say that uh, even the number of islands, sabi nila, 8,000 na daw. Kasi daw, lumubog na yung iba na naging dalawa na because of uh, some, uh, some sea level rise. Uh, most of our crops would be coconut. Uh, fully one-third or about 3 million of those 10 million hectares would be on coconut. Of course, rice, corn, sugarcane, other plantation, and high-value crops. So, uh, however, the biggest threat to this uh, Compounding that is comp uh, compounding uh, climate change. And by the way, uh, the earlier presentations and testimonies here, your honors have told you, particularly from Pagasa, that uh, there is no longer a debate on whether climate change has anthropogenic origins. It's caused by activity of people. Uh, I could tell you that one other threat to agriculture is also anthropogenic. In, uh, in character, and this is conversion of agricultural lands. So our output in agriculture is sluggish. Uh, we have lagging output and yield growth. And the major issues are the major issues way back from the last century. Infrastructure, rural finance, regulatory services, technology, and advisory services. And uh, to cap it, we are a net food importer and we have a very poor export performance. Now, what are the, I would, uh, next please. I would uh, actually uh, identify three principal challenges in agriculture and fisheries. One, uh, attaining and sustaining food security at viable levels of sufficiency. And uh, when you say viable levels of sufficiency, this is primarily also triggered by recent developments on climate change. Uh, before, they said, oh, we can Im just import all of the food that we need uh, as long as we have the money and the foreign exchange to buy it. But now, if you see, uh, if you study the impacts of climate change, not just in the Philippines, but from on those other countries that are affected by climate change, it's not a pretty picture. So those who those economists who were saying that we can rely on international trade are actually uh, standing on very thin ice on this particular argument. Uh, of course, uh, even though a lot of the economies of the world have liberalized, I can tell you as a as a trade negotiator and one who studies uh, the trade patterns and the policies of other countries whom we. Uh, negotiate with in the WTO and on a bilateral basis that uh, 
there is more distortions now in the international markets, more particularly in agriculture. So therefore, the challenge is not just being competitive in international markets for agricultural products, but you want to be competitive in increasingly distorted international markets. Uh, I refer to these markets as the cesspool or the totally polluted international uh, markets because of distortions. Uh, and of course, the game changer, your honors, is we have to be resilient to climate change. Now, uh, next. Well, uh, this this figure is just too small. It just shows you there that uh, in in the copies that you have, your honors, that this is a 2014 uh, index where it shows that the Philippines is a major is one of those uh, vulnerable countries. Uh, in some of the reports, as my colleague Dr. Santos from before has said, uh, various indices will always place the Philippines on top or on the top 10. But I could tell you that uh, if we compare ourselves to countries like from the South Pacific or Maldives, uh, we are the most vulnerable regular sized country in the world. Uh, meron po kasi yung size na parang sakto lang. We are a regular sized country with a regular sized population. So, uh, next please. So these are, uh, let me just uh, run down some of the uh, technical aspects that would be relevant to us in our discussion on agriculture. Uh, and these are, uh, actually I'd like to commend uh, your honors, uh, DOST Pagasa for already localizing and simulating AR4. Uh, I think they will be an AR5, meaning assessment report uh, of the International Government, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It's very important that uh, if our country is to plan and to prepare for climate change impacts, uh, that we are able to localize this uh, particular data. So, DST Pagasa, against all odds, I should say, was able to do this for AR4, and they're, I think, doing it, will do it for AR5. So these are the important ones. One, the increases in annual mean temperatures. Those are very high numbers. 0.9 to 1.1 degrees centigrade by 2020. And 2020 is upon us. Uh, and then 1.8 to 2.2 degrees centigrade by 2050. So when we go later to impacts on what would these numbers mean to agriculture, you will, I mean, you don't need, you don't need uh, a big calculation to be able to deduce what would be the impact. Uh, extreme events. Uh, on ambient temperatures and precipitation, you're going to have more frequent hot days above 35 degrees. If you listen to your radio or your TV and uh, Pagasa is there announcing the temperatures, uh, they've resorted to things like, uh, well, it's uh, 35 degrees, but it's feeling 41. Uh, there will be more dry days of uh, less than 2.5 millimeter rainfall. And that is indeed uh, already drought conditions, Your Honors. And the increase in heavy rainfall events of greater than 300 millimeters. Actually, what I have, what I have not included there is that uh, this kind of an intensity is just like what we had uh, experienced uh, in Ondoy when you have that much precipitation that fell in so short a time. When in fact that that volume of precipitation would have been during the rain would could account for the whole rainy season. So these are all uh, very very disturbing developments. In terms of uh, seasonal rainfall and precipitation, uh, as you see in the Philippines, we have uh, two distinct seasons. Of course, except for some areas in the Philippines where you have wet and very wet, which is like in Caraga. Uh, you have increasingly drier dry seasons, which is what we are increase, uh, experiencing now. And you're going to have increasingly wetter wet seasons. Uh, in terms of tropical cyclones, uh, these numbers, I think, are of, say, 10 to 20 increase in intensities due to increased sea surface temperatures. I think these are average numbers. But we will begin to see, as what we have seen in, in Yolanda or Haiyan, your honors, the radical increase in the physical violence of extreme events. 
So, what are the impacts on uh, agricultural productivity? Let me start with your favorite crop, which is rice. For every one degree centigrade increase in night temperatures, you're going to experience a uh, from the biophysicals of the rice uh, plant something like 10% yield reduction. Uh, why why night temperatures? Uh, let me just explain a little technicality, Your Honors. Most plants, uh, particularly our crops, uh, enjoy. Uh, they they make the food through photosynthetic activity, nutrient uptake from the soil or supplementation. Uh, and during the daytime, uh, with good weather, uh, good ambient solar radiation, and good ambient uh, temperatures, uh, it manufactures food. Okay. Of course, our interest for rice would be manufacture of uh, biomass for grain instead of transferring or manufacturing, doing, tr transferring or uh, manufacturing biomass for just the stem of the leaves. Same is true for fruits, vegetables. Now, in order for this to happen in an optimal way, there must be uh, a big, uh, an optimal difference between daytime temperatures, which need to be hot and you should have solar radiation and at nighttime, which needs to be relatively cooler. If you still have increase, if you have increasingly hot nights, uh, your honors, uh, there is a tendency for all of the uh, biomass that had been uh, manufactured during the day to be degraded, and it's one of the one important cause of the decline in yield or yield reduction. Or uh, in the case of rice, maybe the material is just going to more leaves or more stem. So that's the now sea level rise, which is a slow onset event, your honors. It doesn't happen overnight. That's why I, I was I was pretty much concerned when when people say, ah, oh, we should. Uh, it's going to happen beyond the term of this administration. So let's not do anything about. It. There's just no basis. But we already know from all of the scientific evidence and from the studies and the trends for the from the past century up to now that. Sea level rise is going to happen. Now, sea level rise will increase the salinity in our agricultural lands. And it will not just be those lands that will be in direct contact with, with the sea water. Because as you know, the soil is particularly an effective conductor of water as well through capillary action. So... <coughs> Salinity in rice, uh, your honors, will bring us back to the pre-green revolution levels. Meaning to say, if the average now is uh, average yield for rice is more than four metric tons, we're going to go back to something like 1.5 metric tons per hectare. And most of our productive rice lands are very near sea level. Uh, and you know, these are relatively flat areas which enjoy irrigation, etc. Many of them can can actually yield seven to nine metric tons. With decreasing salinity, your honors, all of that is going to be obliterated and brought back to 1.5 metric tons per hectare. And you don't, I mean, you don't need a extensive calculation <laughs> or uh, thinking or uh, inventing an algorithm to say that that definitely is a very important and decisive threat to food security. Uh, flooding will increase crop losses. And considering that rice is a, it's a water-loving crop, uh, in fact, your honors, you need, uh, in an era of uh, climate change and water scarcity, uh, irrigated rice needs something like 10,000 liters of water to generate one kilo of milled rice. So flooding, uh, however, while we are breeding a uh, variety of rice that can uh, survive under flooded conditions for a prolonged period of time, we're not yet there because the floods that we are experiencing are not only getting longer, they're getting more violent in terms of water flows and water velocity. Uh, of course, water scarcity or drought will severely affect rain-fed areas. And rain-fed areas are particularly important to runners if you talk about uh, poor people because the poorest rice farmers are the ones who tend 
are the ones in the rain uh, the rain fed areas uh, they do not benefit from the irrigation services of government they rely on precipitation uh, while it is possible for them to uh, diversify crops but because there is no uh, good water resources and the way to manage them and government has not reached them in, in so far as that service is concerned uh, they are con they have to be content with uh, one crop of rice and i tell you rain fed rice with no control over water levels uh, is not a very profitable crop uh, you're lucky with four metric tons but the average yield there your honors would be up to about 1.5 or two metric tons now uh climate change your honors will also exacerbate uh, the pest problem uh, particularly uh, bacterial as well as insect pests uh, especially with increasing temperatures this is favorable to many of the pests of concern and pests your honors can really mutate very fast with changing biophysical uh, environmental conditions uh, your pests can actually evolve into more effective and more efficient pests, uh, which is actually not very good news to many of our farmers, nor to all of us, because that means more losses from pests. And, uh, of course, uh, high wind velocities, your honors, you'll note that uh, when uh, Typhoon Pablo approached uh, uh, Davao, Davao Oriental, it was uh, running at something at more than 200 kilometers per hour. And in the last administration, I was asked, uh, why is it that uh, Davao Oriental suffered less damage than uh, Compostela Valley or Davao del Sur, when the, the wind has already abated? But I was telling them, you know, uh, even if most of that that was hit in the coastline is coconuts, that's quite relatively resilient to uh, high, high wind velocities. But in, in, after they have crossed the mountains and the coconut areas, you're, you're going to hit bananas, rice. I mean, if you're still having 100 kilometers per hour, your honors, uh, even, even us people would, would not actually remain standing with those uh, velocities. So we are now experiencing these wind velocities very commonly. Uh, just to provide you also information on losses. Uh, your honors, when I started at the, Philipp at the Department of Agriculture way back in the 1990s, which was uh, the last decade of the last century, uh, if, we, if we lost 30,000 metric tons of palai, to an extreme event like a typhoon is already big news and it's a big deal and it triggers speculation for the sure kailangan mag import na tayo do you know how much we're losing recently your honors uh we're losing anywhere from 300 to 600,000 metric tons of palay if at just uh 50 percent uh 50 percent milling rate which is very low uh, just just to simplify the calculation, we're losing uh, anywhere from 150 to 300,000 metric tons of mill rice due to that due to extreme events. That is uh, that is about how much how we import on a regular basis, Your Honor. Uh, one other thing I would like to know on crops, uh, not just on rice, is that uh, temperatures and the changes in the values of the biophysical parameters like water uh, changes uh, the physical chemical properties of the soil and as you know your honors crops are anchored on the soil so the efficiency with which crops can draw nutrients from the soil uh, the efficiency with which crops can be productive utilizing the soil resources is also affected by uh, the changes in the values of this uh, uh, biophysical uh, factors in our environment like temperature uh, soil moisture available water precipitation and so on next please on corn or maize uh, that's a 1.7 percent reduction in yield for each day above 
30 degrees centigrade under drought conditions. That is pretty much uh, substantial. Although corn is a much more efficient crop because it's what we call a C4 crop. Uh, rice is a C3 crop. It's a less efficient utilization of carbon in the uh, photosynthetic uh, activity. Uh, but still corn would have that uh, losses. It's the losses uh, from various vegetables and fruits would even be higher, Your Honor, particularly for succulents. Uh, we already, our studies already indicate that even without uh, climate change uh, conditions for uh, perishables like fisheries, vegetables, and fruits, uh, the average uh, losses would already be 40%. With climate change impacts with increasing temperatures, you might have noticed on NLEX or in the highways, uh, our, our, yung vegetables nilalagay nila sa garbage bag na black. Uh, baka dapat siguro, lecture natin yung mga naglalagay nyo. Kasi yung black, actually, mas mainit siya. So, pagdating sa divisorya niyan, talagang luto na po. Luto na yung ano. Because of that, no, kung mataas pa yung temperatures, ganun na nga talagang mangyayari. Uh, for livestock, although livestock uh, production in this country can, is a little bit more controlled because nakakulong yan, tsaka ano. Uh, but uh, the feed intake would be reduced by 3 to 5% for every 1 degree centigrade above 30 degrees centigrade, your honors. Uh, when when your animals will have uh, reduced uh, feed intake, you also have productivity losses. Uh, not only that, your honors, there might be some, there will be temptation for livestock producers to utilize more quick solutions that actually have, uh, uh, can have uh, health, uh, public health concerns. Like, uh, napansin nyo po dati, 45 days ang manok, Tapos ngayon, 30 days. Tapos they're talking about the two-week chicken. Uh, merong nilalagay sa feeds na... Uh, that's why uh, I, I, I am... Uh, I, I'm actually talking to our livestock people to have this uh, evaluated. Uh, kasi we have complaints na... Although wala pa namang nagsasabi na pag kumain ka ng commercial chicken, magkakaroon daw na sex reversal or things like that. But we want, we want our consumers, even though with all of these advances in technology, we want our consumers to be assured that the food that they eat and procure from the markets are totally safe. But uh, when you have these kinds of pressures on farm production, there is a temptation for profit makers to really resort to these kinds of methods like steroids, etc. No? Uh, and of course, uh, your honors, us people can adjust to uh, temperature rise. You have your air conditioning, and therefore uh, your fertility and your libido does not decline. Uh, livestock, and you need livestock to reproduce. You need them to, to produce eggs. You need your pigs, your breeding pigs, to produce big litters. Uh, there is, of course, definitely, most definitely, even your animal physiologist will tell you that there is definitely a substantial impact uh, on the libido of animals uh, and their reproductive uh, ability, even on fish. Okay. Uh, I will skip the slides on uh, uh, marine and coastal habitats uh, and just say that, uh, Your Honors, uh, our marine and coastal resources, our farmlands, and our forests are all interconnected. Uh, I'm not going to comment on why they separated DNR from DA, uh, but uh, your honors, the, the way to approach this to mitigate or to reduce impacts or to prepare for uh, a phenomenon that affects all of this without distinction, with, doesn't distinguish between forests, etc., etc., is to really look at it from the point of view of, uh, I'll just tell you that uh, as, a, as, a, as a nature and a wild bird photographer, if I see the, the forest and I see the, I have an estimation of the, uh, of the bird life, the wild bird life there, I can, I, I have a pretty good idea what kind of a forest 
that is what is what are the likely problems and how much that forest can support. If you are an agriculturist and you have, don't have an appreciation of the water sales and the forest, you have no business doing agriculture. You should be in the stock exchange. Now, uh, impacts uh, next. One of the things is uh, that has not been really uh, discussed much would be rural infrastructure. The increasing violence of extreme events, uh, and even you know the slow on slow developments on the biophysical front of our environment will substantially increase losses in public infrastructure investments. And when you have a government that says build, 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 kami sa rural sector, sabi namin, kahit na yung build, 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 eh, small letters na lang, okay na kami. Uh, wala na, kahit wala super highway, ayusin lang yung part to market roads, yung bridges, uh, yung market. Ano. Uh, this is important, your honors, because if typhoons, extreme events, or and the uh, the infrastructure we build are not in accordance or cannot survive the increasing physical violence of extreme events and climate change impacts. Not only will they be uh, a crime against taxpayers, uh, but it's going to make it difficult for our farmers to access their own markets. I have farmers complain to me saying, eh, mabuti pa yung farmers ng America na access yung market natin. I have, a, I have a market just 15 kilometers away because it's a bad road and uh, and the typhoon just washed out the, the bridge. I cannot physically access it. Now, these things are, we need to be very, very sensitive to, this, uh, to these things. But rural infrastructure damage, uh, loss and damage is really an important impact that will have a, a strong, uh, a strong uh, effect on agriculture. Rural investment, your honors. Uh, next, uh, investments are the investments are the fuel of the engines of agricultural industry or any industry. Without investment decisions, you're not going to have growth in any. I mean, if you're running a store and you just uh, just maintain it, you don't invest in anything else, uh, it's going to stay, I still, it might even decline. So investments are the source of growth. But uh, investments uh, rely essentially on risk assessment. Now, many say that farmers are afraid or averse to risk. Uh, even my professors in the University of the Philippines tell me that farmers are averse to risk. My exposure to our farmers and having to deal with them in my so many, more, nearly 40 years in government, your honors, exclusively on agriculture, tells me that farmers are not averse to risk. Farmers have lived with risk all their lives. They've known how to deal with risk and they were able to calculate whether they will do this or they will do that. So farmers have always, in fact, all of us deal with risk. It is uncertainties that we cannot deal with. Farmers cannot deal with something that is dicey. When they are faced with an uncer with uncertainty or an uncertainties, this is when farmers go to the church or go for a novena, or that is why Ngayon, di na nila alam, magpo-florist ni Mayo na ba tayo? O... Well, because, so, therefore, your honors, one important impact on the minds of our people and the way they decide, particularly among our farmers, is a lot of the risks that they confront and they deal with successfully and from which they learn their lessons is the conversion and transformation of this risk into uncertainty. So therefore, these uncertainties need to be reconverted back, you know, into things that they can discern, things that they can calculate. But if it is just, uh, eh, siguro, sadyos na lang natin yan. Mahirap po yan. You cannot, you cannot, ano. 
you cannot make a business. So therefore, these uncertainties deter investments and will severely constrain profitability and income, sector growth and development. Why is this important, Your Honors? For our country, we seem to have been obsessed with FDIs and foreign investments. The investment of our farmers and the profitability of their investments will generate wealth that will not leave this country. Unlike your call centers or multinationals or foreign corporations or your FDIs. So therefore, uh, at the department, we're very, very much concerned that uh, we look at the impact of climate change on the psyche of our farmers and whether it is blunting their will to invest or adapt technology. Because most definitely, this will have not just a big impact on their own personal income and livelihoods, but on sectoral growth and the growth of our country. Because after all, all of these indust industries, their base is still agriculture in the rural sector. On environment and agriculture, next please. Uh, new pests and diseases will rapidly evolve profiles. And, Your Honors, as I've said, what will endanger our forest in terms of uh, pests will also endanger, therefore endanger, agriculture. Uh, also, we have a Bureau, of, we have a BMB in the DNR. But one of the, we will have suffered losses most definitely in the other precious but often ignored natural resource for agriculture. And these are our biodiversity resources. You know? uh, and the endemic gene pool. Uh, we've often said that, you know, what dominates Philippine agriculture today are hybrids. Uh, these are the ones that have uh, embedded terminator technology. You cannot home save the seeds, etc. But we do have a rich, although uh, unexplored uh, by diversity and a genetic pool that we can use to develop our own that will not heavily rely on uh, what commerce is today. Now, all threats to the forest and watersheds translate, and I should say this, Your Honors, in magnified manner, threats to agriculture and fisheries. The increasing difficulties in recovering watersheds will leave irrigation systems, as I would describe them, to be more precipitation dependent rather than watershed supported. Walang kwentang irrigation systems po yan. Uh, and therefore, this is a an irrigation being an important factor in agriculture. If we have this situation and this persists, then this becomes the primary constraint to increasing productivity and technological change in agriculture. Nakakita na ba kayo ng agriculture na hindi na kailangan ng irrigasyon? All of life needs water and it needs to be managed. We were telling uh, a lot of the politicians who were demanding, we need irrigation systems. You know, when you only have a 7% uh, watershed forest cover, your honors, it's very difficult to make decisions on irrigation infrastructure. You can spend a trillion on irrigation and cover every farmland with irrigation, but if there is no water set to support them, then it's, uh, I mean, it's sunk, sunk investment. And it's, I, I should say, a crime against the taxpayer. Now, what is the impact of climate change on this? Your honors, climate change further exacerbates and makes it difficult to recover the water source because of the increasingly adverse bio, uh, uh, biophysical environment and conditions. So it's going to be very, very difficult to uh, recover those water sets and have the proper irrigation. Now, on people, uh, the general population, therefore, your honors, with all of the, uh, with all of those that I have previously discussed, for the general population, it means general supply challenges. It's been a long time. The last time we had uh, rationing or lines to buy rice was when I was an undergraduate in 1974. It should reveal my age, your honors. That was the last time. Now, 
if we are not careful, this is going to be, uh, this might be the result. Food supply challenges are going to be a, a particular future. Higher food prices because of higher production costs. You're going to have, because of your difficulties and your damage to infrastructure, you're going to have higher logistic costs. And because of this, you're going to, to have higher malnutrition and food insecurity risks. Now, your honors, and of course, this on top of other serious impacts on public health, loss of life and property. Of course, we had, how many did we lose in Haiyan or Yolanda? Some, some pegged it at 10,000, probably more. Now, your honors, the impact, I would like to say this, the impact of climate change, uh, many say is, uh, it doesn't spare anybody. Sabi nila, the great equalizer is climate change. I disagree. Because whether we like it or not, climate change will further magnify the manifestations of unfairness and inequality in society. The rich will be more agile. They will have more resources to adjust and to adapt and to protect themselves. The poor will become increasingly vulnerable. So the poor will suffer the most and are the less agile and have less resources. So let us not buy this uh, very nice uh, tagline about climate change being the great equalizer. It is the great game changer to governments, to people, and communities. Now, to farmers, well, you're going to have higher production and marketing costs. Next, please. Uh, and therefore, this would lessen their, their, their cost, and this will make them uncompetitive. Uh, our government does not essentially provide adequate subsidies to our farmers, just like what other, particularly the developed countries, who virtually smother their agricultural sectors with subsidies. Anywhere from production subsidies to export and marketing subsidies. We don't provide those. They're not sexy in the appropriations process. Uh, there will be, of course, income losses from reduced productivity. Reduced opportunities for income and livelihood and diversification. So, your honors, even in a, the, if other, the, especially the developed countries, who, by the way, your honors, I would submit because you had a question earlier, or, or do you, who do you think caused climate change? I think that is no longer in debate. Uh, those developed countries that started this uh, from the industrial age and continue to do so are the, are the real uh, culprits of climate change. But the other noxious thing that will happen, Your Honors, that they also protect and subsidize their farmers. And we are a market of 100 million or more and growing. And it is a consumer base that has a very high propensity to buy imported. So what do you think is going to happen to our farmers whose cost of production have increased, whose cost of logistics and marketing has increased, whose bargaining power has declined? They are going to be obliterated out of their own domestic markets by foreign farmers. If there is anything that has spawned rebellions or revolutions in the past against the Spaniards, against the Spanish, against the Republic. It is the situation, Your Honors. So this is going to endanger even the state and the government. But the victims will also be the poor and those in the agricultural sector. Uh, of course, the fishers, you're going to have reduced catches and increasing costs. Uh, my, my colleague has also told us increase, increased pressures for fishing effort to exceed carrying capacity of marine resources. And there is definitely going to be temptation for IUU fishing. Because, you know, we have uh, followed uh, our, we have our own IUU disciplines. We're trying to 
promote this program so that we are a responsible fishing nation because we are a major fisheries nation. And IUU fishing is something that is uh, that is not consistent with our role as a major fisheries nation. But all of these impacts on our marine resources, even the coastal areas, even on aquaculture, will drive many people to flaunt the disciplines on IUU fishing. <clears throat> uh, I would like to uh, close your honors by saying uh, the following. Your honors, uh, there, are, there are things that happen in the short term for climate change, like extreme events. Uh, they're sexy to the press. They're sexy for politicians. But there are things on climate change that happens way beyond the political life of our political leaders or even our tenures in government. And I refer to slow on evidence. We cannot wait. We have to use the insights from science, particularly climate science and the biological sciences, to be able to for us to be able to evaluate ahead and prepare for slow onset events. We cannot wait to generate our own data here. We cannot wait to, for those researches to finish so that we have an unequivocal uh, conclusion about, because as far as I'm concerned, Your Honors, when you talk about slow onset events, events like temperature rise, Meron pa bang argument dyan na uh, may problema tayo sa agriculture? May problema sa public health? Wala na eh. You know. We all know that from... And the experience of others who have their own string of data, we don't need to reinvent and wait. Because whether we like it or not, we have to do our preparations and our adaptation to climate change now. So we can... So we have to make those decisions, even if we are not exhaustive in the data. Okay. Your Honors, climate change has prejudice most definitely against agriculture and fisheries and its population. There is prejudice to the poor. In fact, Your Honors, I should say that in the face of the recent extreme events, extreme prejudice. Many of our fellow citizens have been terminated by climate change impacts with extreme prejudice. Your Honors, while the Philippines adapts, uh, while the Philippines will need to adapt to climate change, Your Honors, those who cause climate change, and I should say the industries and those countries and those governments that initiated this in the industrial revolution and did not institute environmental discipline so that they can uh, have a mitigation program or mitigate their impacts on the environment must perform mitigation in accordance with what climate science provides and demands and not only that your honor this is uh, we are a victim a crime has been committed against the environment and against our country and our people. And therefore, it is my submission, Your Honor, that this party should make reparations to their victims of their actions. I would stop there, Your Honor, uh, and I would, I would, uh, I'd be happy to uh, entertain any clarification or questions. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Serrano. Yeah. Um, yes, Your Honor. Um, in the interest of time, since we still have one more witness, Your Honor, we will be presented via Skype. Um, this representation will just be having just one question, and we will submit to the Honorable Commission if it has other questions to to uh, to ask. Um, Yusek Serrano. Yusek Serrano, thank you for the very enlightening presentation. Um, just one quick question, Yusek Serrano. Has the uh, Department of Agriculture uh, specifically identified agricultural sectors or uh, areas 
that um, were severely affected or impacted. And um, do we have data as to the number of the farmers affected? Uh, we have, in fact, used uh, satellite imagery. Uh, as to the number of farmers affected by climate change impacts, that's 100% farming sector. No farmer in this country has been exempted from the impacts of climate change. And, and uh, let me just uh, provide you with a curious but uh, less known fact. If you know the Agriculture and Fisheries Modernization Act, which was enacted in 1996, there is a section there that mentions the responsibility of government and for the programs of the Department of Agriculture to address climate change and global warming. Of course, at that time, they frequently used global warming. But as early as the 1996, this is already in our minds. Of course, we proposed these uh, uh, efforts for adaptation. <laughs> we, I mean, I entered the Department of Agriculture, Office of the Secretary in 1998. And it was only, I think, about only about three years ago that we were provided appropriations to support climate adaptation. Because our contention, uh, Council, Your Honours, is that every farmer in this country has already been affected. Some prejudice has already happened. And we need to be able to arm our constituency in agriculture to be able to adapt to climate change. We don't prioritize mitigation. We're not going to reduce greenhouse gases for those who have caused this. We will clean up and mitigate what we emit. That's it. But since this is already happening, Your Honors, our primary concern this adaptation of our people to climate change. So uh, you can go to a to the DA website, uh, and you can see there a uh, the emergence of a. Uh, we have this map, Your Honor. You click it. Uh, you want to know what crop is viable in this particular municipality, even barangay. It will show you. This is based on our. Uh, uh, satellite images and how we process the, the maps. Uh, we also use the maps that have been generated in the layers from the OST, from DNR, kasi walang ano, and then we just generated those that are of particular uh, interest to the Department of Agriculture. So like water hazards, storm surge, ito yung ano eh. Uh, you will see there, if you go to Tacloban, for example, uh, it will identify to you what areas in Tacloban where you need to put uh, human settlements, where it is not safe to put this, because the land is already classified in terms of vulnerability. Uh, sadly, Your Honors, I observed that the developments in Tacloban have more or less followed uh, the old. Uh, so, uh, as they say, uh, history repeats itself. But the next experience is usually much more painful than the last. Thank you, Yusek Serrano. Your Honours, um, that would be all for the witness. If you do have questions, Your Honours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Yusek Serrano. Uh, there's a witness uh, who will be testifying via Skype. And uh, in the interest of time, uh, for now, we will have no more questions for you. But we might request you to come back uh, uh, at a later date for perhaps more uh, uh, testimony or information or question. Thank you very much. We will be at your service, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you. Your Honor, may the resource person, you six, Rana, be excused? Witness is excused. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, you six, Rana. Is our next... Uh, can we have a five-minute break for everybody before we proceed to the next and last witness? Okay, thank you.
All rise. The Honorable Inquiry Panel Chairman, Commissioner Roberto Eugenio T. Cadiz, still presiding. Everyone may be seated. Thank you very much. Uh, we shall now resume the public hearing. Uh, Council, uh, are you ready to present your last witness for today? Ready, Your Honours. May we call on our last witness and resource person for today, Mr. Michael Addo. He will be presenting via Skype. Mr. Witness, can you please raise your right hand? Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under the provisions and the penalties as provided by law? I do. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Council, you can now proceed to present your witness. Your Honours, you are presenting Mr. Michael Addo. He is a professor of law at the University of Notre Dame, a director of the law program at the London Global Gateway, and a member of the United Nations Working Group on Business and Human Rights. He is requested to present here to explain the issue of human rights responsibility of transnational corporations and business enterprises. For preliminary questions, Your Honor, may I proceed? Please proceed, Council. We have several documents, Your Honors, and two documents, rather one document, has been submitted and remarked on 21st of May 2018. It's the profile and statement of Michael K. Addo consisting of nine pages, which we received via email from Mr. Addo. It is remarked as exhibit QQQQ to QQQ-8. The same document, Your Honor, bears the signature of Mr. Michael Addo, which was pre-marked on the same date as QQQ-8-8. For confirmation of uh, Attorney Esguera, Your Honours. All right, proceed. Uh, the exhibits have been co confirmed. We received additional documents and we submitted the same this morning. and. It is entitled PowerPoint Presentation of Michael K. Addo, which was also pre-marked just a few hours ago. And it was pre-marked as Exhibit SSSS to SSS-20 for confirmation of Atarius Garayonis. Uh, thank you. Uh your witness can now start testifying. Mr. Addo, can you please confirm first, confirm and affirm the contents of all the documents that I just mentioned, as well as the sending of those documents via email to us, the legal representatives of the petitioners? Yes, I confirm and affirm that these are documents that are prepared and sent to you for submission to the commission. Thank you very much, Mr. Addo. You may now start with your presentation. Thank you very much. Um, your Honours, um, I appear before you as a witness for the petitioner to present before you the United Nations Guardian Principles on Business and Human Rights and the responsibilities that these Guardian Principles set out for business enterprises and to also assess the implications of these guiding principles for climate change. In order to do this, I have prepared a presentation, a copy of which, Your Honours, has been submitted in as official document 
but I'd like to go through the presentation by sharing my screen uh, with you, if that is okay. Please, please proceed. That's perfectly all right. Now, I'd like to start by a, a snapshot, a snapshot statement. So the guiding principles on business and human rights were unanimously endorsed by the United Nations Human Rights Council in 2011. They are the very first normative set of standards at the global level on human rights and business. And they provide, to the best of my knowledge, the most authoritative reference point for states and companies. They provide clear normative standards, clear operational guidance, and establish a clear platform for action. And it is out of these actions that we will then discern the human rights responsibilities of um, private corporations. If it, if it pleases your honor, I'd like to start with a little bit of a background to um, the United Nations guiding principles. Now, the United Nations, fairly early on, perhaps as far back as the 1970s, with a lot of challenges involving adverse human rights impacts caused or contributed to by companies, especially transnational corporations. And the United Nations since that time has embarked on a campaign to search for effective standards. And these standards have gone through a whole gamut of um, campaigns and exercises, none of which has been successful. And the last uh, unsuccessful effort was in 2003, when the then Commission for Human Rights tried to um, um, discuss the subject of the United Nations norms on business and human rights, which were then rejected. As part of that um, failure, the Human Rights Commission, which subsequently became the Human Rights Council, invited the Secretary General of the United Nations to appoint a special representative to be able to explore uh, the scope of business and human rights. And it was in 2005 that the Secretary General nominated a special representative in the form of Professor John Raggi with a very specific mandate to identify and clarify existing standards and practices with regard to business and human rights. Well, to cut a very long story short, after three years of multi-stakeholder consultation, the kind of consultation that involved um, discussions with business enterprises, business associations, victim group, civil society and advocacy groups, as well as government experts. Um, John Raggi came up in 2008 with a framework. And the framework was um, uh, on business and human rights was, on the, was referred to as the Protect, Respect and Remedy framework. Now, the essence of this framework was essentially a number of things. Number one, that no particular single individual stakeholder on their own could settle all the issues and difficulties arising from business and human rights, and that it required a cooperative shared responsibility. It was also very clear that the standards had to be flexible enough to take account of the different kinds, sectors, and sizes of companies. Now, this idea of shared responsibility and the flexibility, and as well as taking account of all the various standards that had previously come before the Protect, Respect, and Remedy framework, made the United Nations Guiding Principles quite unique. And I shall explain the uniqueness in a moment. This, which then accepted it and then extended the John Rackett's mandate for another three years with the specific mandate to find ways of operationalizing these uh, standards. Well, in 2011, he came up with what is now known as the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, in which he articulated the clear duties of states and the clear responsibilities of companies and the expectations of victims or civil society groups. 
of course, so as to realize the, the standards. The Human Rights Council also set up the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights with a mandate to disseminate and implement the guiding principles. This working group, Your Honor, is the one on which I have had the honor over the last six years to serve as a member and for part of the time to act as its chair. This then concludes my introductory background to the guiding principles. I'd like to talk a little bit more about the guiding principles themselves. Um, they are a very compact set of 31 guidelines broken into three clear parts, the three parts of which we call pillars. Pillar one, pillar two, and pillar three. Now, the three pillars look separate, but they're actually interrelated. The first of these pillars, the state duty to protect against human rights abuses by third parties, including business. Again, I'll come down to explain a little bit more detail of these three pillars. And the second pillar relates to the responsibility of all businesses, including transnational corporations, to respect human rights. And as part of this, they undertake or they are expected to avoid causing harm that undermine human rights. And then the third pillar states that governments and businesses must ensure access to remedy for victims of business-related human rights. As I mentioned, these are three separate pillars, but actually very interrelated. In other words, one without the other is unlikely to make the process successful. Now, here is another representation of the three pillars. This time, from the point of view of actors. So the three pillars indicate who the main actors are in each, each particular, under each particular pillar, even though other actors will have interests. So we identify here three main actors, the state, the businesses, and the victims. And what each of these need to do or to expect. So the state is expected adverse human rights impact. And the businesses are expected to respect all human rights. And the victim expects in the event that the state is unable to protect them, or in the event that the company does not respect human rights, a remedy. And then it goes on to talk exactly about what does the protect mean. Well, again, I'll have an opportunity to explain a little bit more as I proceed with my presentation. And um, now the question that arises is how different are the guiding principles? What value do they add to everything else that we have known prior to? The, the guiding principles. Well, the guiding principles have this extra character of developing a common understanding between the different stakeholders of their roles and their responsibilities, and the expectation of how each role or each actor will deliver their responsibilities and their roles. So that common understanding was something that had been missing from previous iterations of business and human rights. The second added value of the UN Guiding Principles is to try and draw on the strengths and the benefit of all previous um, uh, platforms and frameworks and activities and standards. So of course, it does not create new standards. It tries to draw together all our understanding of expectations of business under corporate social responsibility, under business ethics, under sustainability, labor standards, and OECD uh, uh, standards. It is, by all means, not uh, uh, an international law binding in itself. It's a soft law platform. But the beauty of the United Nations Guided Principle is the idea that it draws on binding legal obligations that states and companies are required to follow. The binding obligations in international law for states that have ratified treaties or are bound by customary international law and binding uh, expectations in national law for corporations. It therefore provides a very clear platform for companies, governments and civil society organizations to define clearly how to act and how to advocate for change. If I may, Your Honours, 
add one or two other aspects of what makes the UN Gallery principle special. And of course, some of these are fairly obvious, and I may have referred to this. And this is the provenance of these guiding principles, how they were created. They were created as part of a very global wide consultation with every and any stakeholder. So this allows for every stakeholder to have this in their contributions to accept that their standards have also been taken into account. Similarly, the guiding principles recognize the flexibility of the business landscape and what we can expect of transnational corporations may be different from small and medium-sized enterprises. It also recognizes the value of what already exists in the activities of companies in terms of CSR and corporate sustainability. And this, it puts together into what we call the smart mix of uh, 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 standards. But above everything else, the strength of the UN guided principles lies in the recognition of the shared responsibility between actors. That government has a clear role, that businesses have a clear role, and civil society groups have a very clear role. And with this, I'd like to explain a little bit more of the details of the guiding principles. Now, a little misunderstanding often is to separate the guiding principles or the role of states from companies. But actually, the point that I would like to emphasize in this presentation is the interrelated role and responsibilities of companies and the state. Now, we understand that both the state and the company are required to respect human rights. Both government agencies and private actors must avoid infringing on human rights. But we often think then that only the state has the duty to promote and to protect and fulfill. There may be instances where we refer to the leverage of companies where using the leverage to um, ensure the respect of human rights in its um, business relationship does create a certain sense of promotion and a certain sense of protection. But we can talk about that in a little bit more detail. But the point I want to make is the idea of the intermingling of responsibilities in order to achieve effectiveness. It's a very quick snapshot that all the guide, all states are bound by the guiding principles. All companies, regardless of size, regardless of sector, and regardless of country of operation, have to follow the guiding principles. And the guiding principles follow are based on all the internationally recognized human rights. And my next slide will explain this in a little bit more detail. No new legal obligations, and this is understandable that the guiding principles does not craft new uh, uh, obligations, but only elaborates on the implications of existing uh, obligations that are all brought together into a coherent system. But of course, we also take the view that effective respect for human rights involves meaningful engagement across all the stakeholders. Rights cannot be upset, offset by good deeds. So the fact that you've built a school, the fact that you have built a hospital for a local community, does not exempt you from respecting all the other human rights. Now, I did mention that the guiding principles apply to all human rights, and I thought I'd take some time to explain a little bit more. Now, the UN guiding principles indicate that the rights, the necessary rights for companies to respect are based in the Universal International Bill of Rights and the ILO Declaration of Fundamental Principles of Right to Work. In truth, between these two broad areas of rights, um, the guiding principles captures every known human rights because the International Bill of Rights covers the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it covers the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. Similarly, the ILO Declaration covers the core aspects of ILO work relating to business, including forced labor, freedom of association, non-discrimination, and child labor. But there is a little bit of a sting in the tail which is not so evident in expressed terms in the guiding principles. And the guiding principles indicate that these are the baseline of human rights standards. That in particular circumstances, certain additional standards may be necessary. 
So, for example, in the conversation about climate change, we may look beyond the International Bill of Rights and look to environmental standards. Similarly, in conflict-affected areas, we will want to look specifically at um, international humanitarian law as additional sources of standards that companies will be expected to apply. So the discussion goes beyond the International Bill of Rights and the ILO Declaration under the UN Guiding Principles. So the fact that the United Nations Guiding Principles were endorsed by the UN Human Rights Council means something fairly subtle and yet significant. Number one, it means that the UN Guiding Principles have very strong global political support. There was no objection, no rejection during the endorsement of the guiding principles. The second part or the second um, important factor in the endorsement is that it's the first time that an external, externally generated set of standards have been endorsed by the political institution without change. It therefore affirms its independent character in other words, it actually distances it, the guiding principles from the political differences and uh, uh, often negotiations of the United Nations. So we can then say that solid global point of reference, a common standard of application for every actor, including states and including businesses. Now, if I may, Your Honours, I want to take a step into the depth a little bit of a depth on the individual pillars of the guiding principles. I will focus largely on pillar two, the responsibility of companies to respect human rights, and pillar three. But I thought I should introduce a little bit more context of the state's duty to protect. Now, the state duty to protect is based on the understanding that the state is the ultimate authority for protecting everyone in its territory and within its jurisdiction from human rights abuses. And this creates a set of um, um, practical uh, uh, expectations within the uh, governance within the state. And I'm thinking of four broad areas in its general regulation, the state as an economic actor, the issues of intra-state agency relationships, and conflict affected areas. These are just four policy areas that I want to refer to. There may be other policy areas, and I could have included um, as a specific policy area, uh, the subject of climate change, but I think my subsequent presentation will bring that out. Now, in the regulatory area uh, for the state duty to protect, the expectation is that the state will pass adequate laws to ensure that everyone's rights are protected. Not just that, that these laws will be enforced. But also, in addition, as set out in Guiding Principle 2, that the state will provide clear guidances to all actors, including businesses, of what the state expects of them as far as the respect of human rights is concerned. On the, on the next square, or on the next uh, quarter of the policy areas that I have identified, it is quite important to acknowledge that the state does trade. The state does act as an economic entity in many ways, either through state-owned enterprises or through private-public partnerships or through joint ventures and so on. And here, the guiding principles, it's very, very clear that the state as an economic actor has to take additional steps and lead by example for other private actors to follow. So in its procurement of, of, of uh, economic facilities, for example, it can expect that uh, most of its partners will respect human rights. And in fact, there are a number of countries, including Canada and, and other countries, where the state private entity can bid for a government contract unless they have made a commitment to the UN Guiding Principles to respect human rights. On the third quarter to, to the right on policy coherence, this is quite important for as part of the state's duty to protect because we often get tensions between government departments and government agencies. 
So you get tension between if they were a ministry for human rights and women, a ministry for the protection of children or a ministry um, for foreign affairs, and the Ministry of Commerce or Ministry of Trade, the Minister of Finance, where the Ministry of Trade, the Ministry of Commerce, often believe that their responsibility is to encourage business and free market and don't feel that they are bound by the respect for human rights. Now, the Guardian Principle suggests that there's going to be this kind of consistency in the recognition of government duties in terms of creating policy coherence across these agencies. At the international level, you often see um, government departments and the Human Rights Council advocating for the respect of human rights, and then they take a step back in Washington, before the Washington institutions of the IMF and the World Bank, or in the negotiation of multilateral investment agreements where they soon forget human rights. So again, the Guardian Principles proposes that as part of the state's duty to protect, they will have to ensure there is coherence at this international um, level as well. Finally, in conflict-affected areas, and because of the heightened risk of human rights violations in conflict affected areas. The guiding principle sets out the expectation that there will be clear guidance to actors, including businesses, um, on the respect of human rights. It will also create opportunities for um, access to remedy in these circumstances. And again, this is just a, a short summary of the state duty to protect. I would like, if I may, move on to the corporate responsibility to respect, because this is and the core area where I have been invited to share my own reflections. Now, to start with, the corporate responsibility to respect is not new. And it creates very no new standards in that no matter the context, no matter the sector, companies must refrain from violating human rights. If this statement were reversed and were put in the form of a question to the company, whether any company believes that it is its duty or its responsibility or is part of its business to violate human rights, you find the answer is always no. Companies acknowledge that their task is not to violate human rights, but actually to increase the welfare. So we understand that this is not new obligation. And if that's all it requires is that they do no harm including human rights harm. They must not do harm themselves, but they must also not contribute to harm. They must also take clear steps to prevent harm or where prevention is not possible to mitigate um, impacts on human rights. In addition, where harm has already occurred, they must address these impacts. And again, to emphasize the point, to do no harm, not to contribute to harm, to prevent harm, to mitigate harm or address harm, applies to all companies, regardless of size, sector, or location. And it applies to all the human rights that I have previously referred to in the International Bill of Rights and the ILO Declaration. Now, how do companies prevent harm? How do companies mitigate harm? Well, fairly simply, to do it in exactly the way they would have done in any financial or trading context, to be able to know and show that they do not prevent, uh, they do not cause harm. And to do this, the guiding principles propose that they should undertake human rights due diligence. It is true, human rights due diligence, that any enterprise can understand the exact nature of the, its role and its contribution to harm, in this case, its contribution to climate change. And so define exactly how each enterprise can prevent, mitigate, or remedy any harms. Not knowing your role, your contribution, of course, means you are unable to redress the harm. Due diligence, therefore, is the key to corporate respect for human rights. How then do you set out to identify and prevent or mitigate or undertake human rights due diligence? Well, I have set out here five clear elements. They are not exhaustive, but they are clearly indicative. Number one, every company has got to commit 
expressly at the highest level to respect human rights. And most companies appreciate this. They must also take steps to assess the impacts of their activities. This must include real impacts and potential impacts. Once they have undertaken this assessment exercise, hopefully this will reveal the potential impacts that their companies will have. But they must then integrate the lessons of these assessments into the activities where they know that a particular activity will cause adverse harm. For human rights is that they will avoid doing or causing this harm. Where evidence from the assessment suggests that not them, but that somebody in their um, um, supply chain is contributing to uh, 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 harm, including climate change, they will be expected to use their leverage and their support to be able to um, uh, uh, mitigate or prevent such harm. They must therefore be able to say that they know that they are respecting human rights, be able to track all the harms that they have identified in their assessment and how they are responding to these harms. If they are able to track these and incorporate that into their policies, well then they should be fairly free enough to communicate how they do this. And communication via reports, via blogs, by annual meetings, um, it doesn't matter as long as they know exactly how they do this. Hence the phrase knowing and showing. A company that's not able to know nor able to show that it respects human rights cannot claim to respect human rights. So what are the expectations for climate change or what's the significance of this corporate respect for human rights for climate change? Well, there is a general expectation that companies will avoid causing human rights harm by not contributing or being linked to climate change. They can also do so by undertaking clear due diligence in order to know and show that they are not contributing to climate change or that they are not causing climate change or any harms that contribute to climate change. It is my clear understanding that climate change poses serious human risk in a whole variety of ways um, to human rights, including life, liberty, in food. Uh, I heard the previous contributor from the Minister of Agriculture indicates the impact of climate change on food security. But it also includes um, risks to housing, sanitation and water, freedom of movement, uh, health, labor rights, issues of modern slavery, cultural rights, but about everything else, threats to the right to self-determination. The Office of the High Commissioner has prepared a very detailed assessment uh, on the impact of climate change on human rights. Now, these adverse impacts can be especially acute for particular communities and vulnerable groups, including children, women, indigenous peoples, people with disabilities, minorities, migrants, and older people. Now, these scores are fairly well-known risks. In addition, the guiding principles in Principle 13 um, proposes that business enterprises should avoid causing or contributing to adverse human rights impact and to seek to mitigate these adverse impacts. Just avoid causing human, um, adverse impact, human rights, adverse human rights impact, but also they must not contribute to these. Uh, adverse impact. But above everything else, and this is often overlooked, not only not to cause or contribute, but they must not be linked to any other activity. And that linkage, cause, contribute, link, makes them um, have a, a role in avoiding, mitigating, and addressing human rights impacts across the supply chains. And this is quite a critical part of the responsibility to respect human rights. In summary, just for uh, the corporate responsibility to respect human rights, um, is the idea that they must avoid infringing on all human rights, in this case, human rights impacts rising from their contribution or being linked to climate change. And to be able to do this, they must undertake human rights due diligence in order to be able to know and show that they respect human rights. 
so as to be able to know and show they need to commit to respecting human rights in all their activities. They need to be able to assess the entire business uh, landscape to ensure that they know the risks and the harms that their businesses cause. They take these lessons and integrate them proactively and positively into their business policies. They should track these um, uh, changes in policy and to be able to communicate the, uh, their policies to all stakeholders. If all of this fails to prevent and mitigate human rights, and as a consequence, we have human rights harm, they should be able to provide remedy or remediate. And that provides for me an excellent segue to move into the third pillar of the UN Guardian Principles, access to remedy. This is the third, but still primary um, pillar of the UN Guardian Principles, because without remedy, none of the other two um, pillars will be significant. Access to remedy uh, in Pillar 3 proposes that victims of human rights abuses by companies and by governments or anyone else must have access to an effective remedy for grievance and redress. Pillars 1 and 2, as I say, will only be meaningful if they are combined with Pillar 3. And remedy covers the entire landscape of opportunities, including judicial and non-judicial remedies, but also opportunities to remove or reduce barriers to act. And I shall come to that in a moment. Access to remedy is similarly important for businesses as well. It's not just the government providing remedy, but that businesses must address grievances that they have caused, contributed to, or are linked to. So I want to take these headings of remedies one after the other, but in this instance, with emphasis on two aspects only, and I want to emphasize effectiveness and barriers, because these are the two aspects of remedy that really make them worthwhile. On the question of effectiveness, particularly with judicial mechanisms, the guiding principles expect that um, there will be an impartial judicial uh, mechanism that has integrity and relies on the rule of law and due process. That the courts will not only be aware of the guiding principles and the respect for human rights, but that the courts themselves will be independent and free of corruption. Similarly, that the processes have to be legitimate and peaceful, uh, uh, the pe legitimate and peaceful activities of human rights defenders will not be obstructed. And we have this in the context of the domestic courts or the regional courts, with emphasis on effectiveness. Similarly, we need, as part of the judicial mechanism, to reduce barriers. Some of these barriers are inherent and structural in the legal systems that we have, and we have to find ways of redressing them. One of these is the law on corporations, which allows separate personality, and the, it allows companies to take advantage of the activities of their subsidiaries, which are by law separate entities and not sharing the responsibility. Well, the guiding principles looks beyond that and asks for these barriers to be removed, that you should not allow a company to claim no knowledge, no association, no connection with its subsidiary, unless these are truly separate entities. Hence, the guiding principles suggest that you should ask companies to respect human rights throughout their business relationships. There should also not be claims that face, claimants should not face denial of justice in the host state because uh, uh, there is no access to the home state court. Now here is an intractable difficult situation which the United Nations is currently grappling with, uh, with uh, uh, the Intergovernmental Working Group on a binding instrument to try and provide opportunities for shared responsibility between states so that if the remedy doesn't exist in the host state, Somehow, there's going to be a way in which the whole state can come up and support it. So this is still being yeah, from 
the protection of judicial remedy. Indigenous peoples, women, non-citizens, migrants, and so on, are particularly vulnerable. There are, beyond the legal barriers, some practical and procedural barriers as well, such as the cost of bringing claims, um, and that can often put people off. There's also difficulty of securing legal representation. I mean, the courts may be open, and everybody may come to them, but sometimes the issues are so complex and complicated that you need legal representation, that costs money, and most countries have now begun to take away legal aid. It often makes sense, too, that these claims should be aggregated in terms of group claims or communal claims, but not all jurisdictions allow for that. And state prosecutors should at least be given adequate resources if judicial remedy is going to be effective. Again, this conversation about effectiveness and the reduction of barriers. I'd like to move on very quickly to other non-judicial but state-based mechanisms. And that guiding principle provider state should provide effective, appropriate non-judicial grievance mechanisms because not every kind of grievance will be effectively redressed through a judicial mechanism. So the idea is that to provide other forms of remediation, such as mediation, and uh, cultural uh, uh, sort of dispute settlements or arbitration are also very useful. Um, similarly, as I will draw on examples in a moment, national human rights institutions can provide effective remedy or the national contact points uh, or the OECD. Here too, all or any barriers should be removed or should at least be, re be uh, uh, reduced so as to allow effective remedy. And examples that I have uh, in my mind include labor tribunals, national human rights institutions such as your honorable uh, commission, state-run ombudspersons and national contact points are very good examples to supplement and support judicial mechanisms, not to replace them, but to supplement them. Finally, um, the requirement to facilitate states must facilitate access to non-state-based grievance mechanisms. And these we have at the back of our mind, company or business association grievance mechanisms are very useful. And this may apply to an individual company or through an industry association um, mechanism. It is critical part, it's a critical part of the corporate responsibility to respect human rights through due diligence that we should have a grievance mechanism. And any grievance mechanism to be effective has to follow the effectiveness criteria that's set out in Guiding Principle 31, that it has to be legitimate, it has to be accessible, has to be predictable, has to be fair, has to be transparent, human rights compatible, and have to be based on dialogue. These three pillars, therefore, pull together and human rights. Some operational level um, uh, grievances are company based. Some are also based on multi stakeholder industries, such as the Oxfam Mining Ombudsman or the Fair Labor Association um, mechanism on supply chains. Some are also based in regional banks, such as the European Investment Bank and some of the regional human rights mechanisms. Uh, the Inter-American system, of which I know you will uh, soon hear an expert presentation. The ILO, the International Finance Corporations, Compliance Ombudsman, and the Global Compact Integrity Measures are examples of grievance mechanisms that are out there that may be used by companies. A few key points, if I may, Your Honor, uh, that the guiding principles on business and human rights is a key tool for everyone governments, businesses, civil society, victim groups, on how to implement respect for uh, human rights. And it sets out clearly each person's contribution. It is fairly simple because it's essentially about treating people with respect and dignity. And it's based on how you create a sustainable business and market. It does not undermine businesses at all. It's meant to create businesses that are sustainable. And the key tool for other stakeholders to promote implementation and accountability. The guiding principles, therefore, are useful because they provide a blueprint with concrete and well-tested steps for managing human rights impact. It creates 
um, policies and processes that signal to stakeholders that the company takes responsibility to respect human rights seriously. It moves beyond the law, looks beyond the legal license to operate, because that's often not adequate. It looks to a moral license to operate as well. And not addressing human rights involves risks, serious risks to the company itself. Some of these risks may be reputational, they may be financial, and they may be legal, or even operational. It is therefore in the interest of businesses to respect human rights. Well, I have heard it said often that human rights is good for business. And I have looked for a little bit of evidence. It's not so easy to find evidence that says human rights is good for business. But I do know that there is a lot of demonstrated evidence of no human rights is bad for business. And I should say that none of this is being done in, 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 in empty space as part of the consultation to create guiding principles and also since their endorsement by the Human Rights Council, a number of businesses, individual businesses, but more importantly, industry associations have adopted the guiding principles and have set up clear guidance for their members, the International Chamber of Commerce, the International Council for Mining and Metals, the International Finance Corporation, the OECD, ISO 2600, the adopted the guided principles to close the government's gap. Your Honours, I want to thank you for your very kind attention uh, to my presentation, and I'm therefore now uh, happy to receive any sort of questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Adil. Can you can you show your uh, face again, Mr. Adil? We are looking okay. at uh, different uh, yes Three. windows. Excellent. Thank you very much, Ms. Adam. Just one clarificatory question from us, sir, your honors. Mr. Ado, you mentioned earlier that the elements of a human rights due diligence would be commitment to respect, as in commitment. Mm -hmm. the second one is assessing the impacts of the business operations. Third, integrating and acting on findings. Fourth is tracking responses. And the last element, communicating the impacts. Mm -hmm. So would you say then, being guided by these principles, the UN guiding principles, that if corporations, fossil fuel corporations, for example, would not have an expressed commitment, would not have an assessment specifically on climate change or how it is impacting the climate. And if it has not shown any action, not tracked responses, and not communicated the impacts, would you then say that those corporations violated the human rights responsibility that you just explained? I thank you for that question. Well, um, there's so much else that a company can do that is not in the public domain. And judgments can often be made about a company on account of that. I wouldn't be able to say that a company that has not made an express commitment or an assessment or the five elements that I've set aside necessarily um, will have violated human rights. It's just that I wouldn't know that it is not. I wouldn't be able to know that it has not violated human rights. So it's always in the interest of the company that it knows it's not good enough. To be able to show it is what rounds the circle that we all agree that um, it has at least um, respected human rights. So yes, the, the, question to your, uh, the answer to your question is that not committing 
is often an indication that the company has no idea. And that if you search further, you could see the clear risks. In other words, a company that commits and undertakes due diligence and communicates, it's more likely to be respecting human rights. So the, the, you can't say categorically that by not doing it, you don't respect. But I, I, I think chances are that not committing and not undertaking due diligence suggests the company has no idea what it's doing. Your Honours, may we just ask uh, Mr. Ado to repeat in, in summary, maybe, his answer. Mr. Ado, we missed several parts uh, of your answer because of uh, s silent uh, yeah, gaps, gaps okay. maybe due to the Wi-Fi signal. Can you repeat in summary your answer, Mr. Ado? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And please do stop me if you're missing anything. Um, your question to me was whether a company that does not demonstrate the five elements of due diligence necessarily means it is violating human rights. Was that the question? That's right, Mr. Adu. Yeah. Okay. My answer to you was that there are two parts to the due diligence um, standard. And that's to know and to show. Now, it is possible that a company, by not showing, does not necessarily violate human rights. It may be doing all the right things, but the rest of us do not know it. So my answer to you is that a commitment to the five elements is a clear indication that the company respects human rights. A non-performance of due diligence either suggests the company is unaware of its risks and therefore risks of human rights violation, or it may very well be that non-public commitment, non-public communication, may be that it's doing some good stuff, but we don't know it. Now, my feeling is that a company that has no clear human rights due diligence policy also has no idea what its risks are. And if it doesn't know its risks, chances are that it will commit adverse human rights impacts. So the answer to your question is, it is not so clear, but that chances are that the company doesn't, doesn't respond to the five other violating. It's very likely to be uh, at risk of committing um, human rights, adverse human rights impacts. So if a corporation the harms, it has yes. now the responsibility to have a commitment to assess, to integrate, take action, communicate, and all these things. Is that mm -hmm. correct, Ms. Rado, from what we understand? What that, is, that is the, that's the expectation that the value of assessing and often you can have this assessment even before the business is launched so the value of assessing is to know where your activities will impact and you then take steps to prevent if already some of those activities have moved on you then take steps to mitigate and if they've already gone out of your hands then you take steps to redress so yes to your question a company that knows its harms and its risks but does not take steps to prevent them or mitigate them or redress them is not respecting the rights. And yes, it will be violating the rights. Thank you, Mr. Ada. Your Honor, for your questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ado. Uh, would any of the commissioners have a question for Mr. Ado? Uh, Commissioner Karen Dupit, we'll have some questions for you, uh, Mr. Addo. Good afternoon, okay. Mr. Addo. I just wanted to um, uh, elaborate. Oh, I wanted you to elaborate on uh, 
what you mentioned earlier about state-based non-judicial mechanisms, and you did mention national human rights institutions um, that would be able to provide effective remedy. Um, yeah. What kind of effective remedy can NHRIs have? But particularly, could you provide us instances where national institutions have indeed provided some remedy to victims of uh, corporations and yeah. their um, activities? Right. Thank you very much for your question, Commissioner. Um, I mentioned national human rights institutions as part of the state-based non-judicial remedy as a supplementary source of remedy, because the primary source would be judicial. So the idea is that certain remedies are more suited to um, non-judicial remedies like national human rights institutions. And some of these are often um, mediation, for example. It's an excellent sort of mandate. Or even us, we sit here and watch uh, and participate in a commission of inquiry, just so we can inform ourselves of detail. That's another of those opportunities for a remedy. You could also have much more compelling remedies, such as you know um, requests for compensation if the mandate allows for it. So yes, NHRIs, can actually undertake some of these of instances of NHRIs. Well, I have in the back of my mind the Kenyan National Human Rights Commission with a mandate to um, um, hear complaints or please investigate complaints and compile information which is then the basis for prosecutors or government authorities to take action. I also know of the Ghana National Human Rights Commission with a very specific mandate to hear cases and come to conclusions. The sort of quasi-judicial mandate to hear and award compensation at the end of it, or even issue cease and desist orders. Now, these themselves can be enforced through courts, and the courts will uphold the decisions unless judicial review allows for these to be set aside. So a number of NHRIs do have different sorts of mandates to complement um, uh, uh, the work of judicial bodies. Thank you. That's all for now. Thank you, Mr. Adam. I have a follow-up question to that, uh, Mr. Adam. Could you elaborate more on that pillar three in regard to uh, state-based non-judicial remedies such as NHRI, such as our commission, mm -hmm. in regard to first transboundary issues and in regard to respondents outside of the jurisdiction of the NHRI, uh, which is hearing the case. Right. Now, that's a very interesting question. I mean, by nature, most NHRIs are territorial based with their jurisdiction. And I get the feeling the essence of the question is the very transboundary nature of environmental harm. Um, and so the issue about does the NHRI have the jurisdiction to hear instances of um, petitions from outside the jurisdiction? I imagine that it depends on the mandates of the, uh, of the NHRI and how the Commission will interpret its mandate, particularly if some of the harms are local. And if the harms are local, perhaps my understanding is the harms affect local people. And the Commission, if its mandate allows it, should on its own motion interpret its authority to redress national human rights issues, even if the petitioner is not national. It may only be that the petitioner has brought to the attention of the commission harms within its jurisdiction, which its own people may not have brought to its attention. And I think in if my very humble opinion, the commission should at least want to know the harm Course within its jurisdiction, even if the harm has been brought by somebody from outside of the jurisdiction. That seems to me to fit very well within the mandate to protect human rights within the jurisdiction. In other words, we should not be too strict on 
the nationality and identity of the petitioner. And I imagine this is some of the issues raised by environmental harm. I, I will be a little bit skeptical if the petitioner was non-territorial, referring to harms that are outside of the commission's jurisdiction, with the commission having no connection whatsoever with the basis of the complaint. Now, I say this with great caution because what if the cause of the complaint was from a foreign um, complaining about harm caused outside of the jurisdiction, but by a local company? Now, there, my sympathies will lie with the victim to say if a company from within our jurisdiction has caused harm outside with the government's commitment to protect human rights and not to contribute to human rights harm, I think the commission should at least get to the bottom of it and get to understand what the government is completely um, without linkage, without contribution, without involvement, at least to investigate the basis of that complaint. In other words, I will not turn down a, an application from somebody outside of the jurisdiction simply because they are an outsider. I want to look at a little bit more. Uh, but what about uh, if uh, I, we have no problem uh, in regard to petitioners, uh, even if they are not uh, uh, within the jurisdiction of the local NHRI? But uh, could you comment? Uh, on cases where the respondents, not the petitioners, the respondents are ah, not okay. within the jurisdiction of the NHRI. Okay, sorry, I missed that. So it's a risk when the respondents are not within the jurisdiction of the NHRI. Yes, uh, could you comment on that? Yes, well, there's a very simple phrase in the guiding principles, cause contribute linked. My question then is, could we explore whether the, the, the respondent who is outside of the jurisdiction is linked to a local uh, entity or has contributed, or a local entity has contributed to the external respondent? Because if there is no contribution from a local entity, if there is no um, linkage between a local entity and the external respondent, I think it will be a little bit difficult. Um, uh, for a local NHRI to assume jurisdiction over an entirely foreign respondent. Um, but I think with the nature of globalization and the nature of interlinkages of businesses, it may not be impossible, probably not even difficult, to find a link or a contribution through the supply chain. Uh, but what the, if the NHRI is not uh, exercising a function that is related technically to jurisdiction as mm -hmm. you would normally define jurisdiction in terms of court proceedings, but mm -hmm. the, the process being engaged in is that of investigation or inquiry. Mm -hmm. Would your opinion still be the same? That the NHRI would, would, should not be dealing uh, 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 or handling that case? Oh no, I mean, if it's a, I think my, my opinion will be a little bit more relaxed if it's a fact-finding process. It is an inquisitorial process of trying to get to the bottom of, of, of a set of circumstances. So inviting the um, a witness to contribute to your investigation probably uh, is much it's much easier to do. Of course, as it is, as you say, you cannot compel them to appear, but you invite them to share their views on, on a particular matter, and it's within their discretion to be able uh, to want to do it or not to do it. I would like to think that where it is uh, an inquisitorial process, like the Commission of Inquiry, it's always helpful that the Commission will reach out to anyone who has relevant information whether or not 
I think you should be able to. Otherwise, you will never get to the bottom of the reality unless you share that information. So we we can inquire on acts involving entities outside of the jurisdiction uh, of the commission, uh, but we cannot compel them, uh, for example, to pay damages uh, hypothetically based on the results of our inquiry. Is that what you're saying, uh, Mr. Adam? Um, well, I wasn't going so far. I was saying you can, you can invite them to share their knowledge on the facts. The facts may very well lead you to confirm or affirm that there has been clear human rights violations. You can then propose that there should be remedy. Uh, I'm not so sure that without a, a, an effective um, due process with an opportunity to be cross-examined in a quasi-judicial form, whether it's appropriate to um, sort of compel um, compensation. I think you can. it can be very general in terms of saying, well, look, thank you for your contribution. The evidence seems to suggest that there's been human rights harm. The evidence suggests that you have contributed to this, and some of X, Y, and Z have all contributed to this harm. We think there should be an effective remedy. And the remedy could come up with recommendations on how uh, this can be either a grievance mechanism or, you know, a, a judicial mechanism or mediation, arbitration, or if necessary, with the facts that you have in front of you, propose that this be taken before a judicial entity. I'll be a little bit concerned that the entity was never invited to defend themselves, and then you come up with a, a, a sort of a uh, a, a package that they should pay something. I think that would be a little bit, a bit difficult. So your concern more is in regard to principles of due process, that sure. before a, an NHRI comes up with any finding or responsibility, the respondent should be given an opportunity to present its side. If the NHRI is looking beyond facts and expecting to make firm recommendations, I think due process would be very valuable. Thank you very much, Mr. Rado. Uh, Commissioner Pimentel will have uh, questions. Hello, sir. Thank you Hello. for your patience uh, uh, for waiting for us to get to you. Anyway, I was just wondering, based on uh, the guiding principle of uh, 13, number 13, wherein it says that business enterprises uh, should be should be held or avoid causing or contributing to adverse human rights impacts and yes. should seek to prevent or mitigate adverse human rights impacts that are directly linked to their operations, products, or services by their business relationships, even if they do not contrib contribute to those impacts. Does it have, as you earlier said, something to do with the supply chain? Is it, it does indeed. Okay. It does. That's exactly what it is about. Um, and we have the phrase to cause, contribute, or be linked. When you've caused it, you have the responsibility to remedy it. Yes. If you've contributed to it, you also contribute to remedying it. But where you haven't caused or contributed, but you only link to it, the idea is that you use your leverage to make sure that the one who has caused, contributed to it um, uh, uh, provides remedy. So yes, it does cover the supply chain. And it's not just a single tier. It goes down the entire supply chain. Okay. So for those that who are directly connected to you on the tier, you will obviously have contributed. So you have the remedy. Then as you approach further down the line, the links are less strong. But that doesn't mean, therefore, you could ignore it because you are linked to it. Because you're linked to it, you use your leverage to make them provide the remedy. So yes, it does cover the supply chain. OK, thank you for that. I was just wondering, like if it if a company, example, has a manufacturing firm in one country and that company now sells the produce in another country and um, the company, the manufacturing firm of that same company actually impacts on climate change in that particular country. So you're saying that uh, that company, who's the mother company, can be held liable of human I'm rights violation. Yes, I must be very careful and draw that clear line between climate change and human rights violations because I am focusing on human rights violations. And particularly, um, I know the difficulty of attribution of contribution to climate change, and that's one big science issue 
that I know is still on the table. But where there is clear evidence that a company, by its contribution to climate change somewhere, has caused adverse human rights impacts, if that link can be made, that company is either contributing to the human rights harm or is linked to it. So for me, the difficulty is making sure that that connection is made. Now, you gave the very simple example of producing a product. Well, with that product, there is traceability. If you can trace the product to the harm, then you either have contributed clearly or you have been linked with it. The trouble with climate change is that traceability between cause and harm. And that, I think, is a scientific question. But if that were convincingly established, we have a link. And if we have a link and there's a or linked to the harm. Okay. Um, I was just thinking, hypothetically, if we are to use the argument or the concept of supply chain, can we therefore cross the transboundary issue? Considering that if you tie a company uh, guilty, if you find a company guilty uh, of human rights violation, example, in one uh, part of the world, would you, can we use the supply chain concept to go around the concept of transboundary? Now, from the point of view of the human rights um, guiding principles, there is a very little difficulty with the transboundary issue because of um, what the guiding principles propose. And the guiding principles propose that where there is harm, there's got to be a remedy. So if the harm is clearly linked to the company, you have no particular difficulty. You can always ask the company to redress it or get the right course or talk visa to remedy it. So if you have a, a, a particular uh, clear product made in one country that causes harm in another country and the mother company is somewhere else, just for argument's sake, yeah. a telephone. A telephone has many components. A lot of these components are made in different parts of the world. If it turns out that one of these components is faulty, we know that the, the company that made that false component is in another jurisdiction. But the company that's using that false component is in our jurisdiction. Now, we can very comfortably tell the company, you are linked to this false component, and we will hold you. And we ask you to make sure that the company that's down your supply chain that has produced this faulty uh, product should, call, uh, and should uh, redress this product. For human rights purposes, that's easy. For climate change purposes, that's not so easy. That much as it provides us with the analogy, we will have that difficulty of establishing that connection, the causal connection. So all of, a lot of companies produce um, harm into the environment that has caused um, um, weather uh, or temperatures to arise. The question is then, Every one of these companies has contributed to it. And to that extent, they must take due diligence to show, make sure that they do not contribute to um, uh, 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 whether temperature, temperature rises. But that's it. If somebody says, well, then suddenly in the Seychelles, there's been excessive flooding. Can we hold the company that's based in India for it? therefore the flooding in the Seychelles. I think that's where it becomes a challenge for climate change. For human rights, it's easy to do. Climate change, that causal connection is very difficult. But I'm sure science will be able to make something of it. And if we can, I think, I mean, it, for your hypothetical uh, analogy, it's worth making the argument. It is worth making the argument that we ought to look beyond causation and we ought to look towards harm because we know who has contributed to what. And everybody should make sure that they take due diligence that they do not contribute to it. That's it. Once they do the due diligence, we have our answers to climate change. Thank you, sir.
Uh, Council, do you have any redirect questions for your witness? No more, Your uh, Honours. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Rado, uh, for your very uh, useful insights. Um, and we would uh, ask you, uh, because where are you now? You're in London. Yes, I am in London. Uh, we will be actually conducting hearings there. Uh, no, November, in November, oh. and we would appreciate if you could make yourself av available for longer uh, conversation with the with the panel on this issue. Thank you very okay. much again. And thank you very much. Good morning, Mr. Aldo, and thank you. So maybe thank you very we, much. Maybe Mr. Aldo be excused, Your Honours. You are excused, and thank you very much, Mr. Aldo. Thank you very much. All right, uh, thank you again. Uh, um, Bailiff, uh, do you have other administrative matters to bring up before we adjourn the hearing? Um, no, Your Honor. There is no more? All right, uh, announcements as to changes in schedule uh, for future hearings or tomorrow? Now? Tomorrow, uh, sir, we will be having six witnesses. Six witnesses, and we start at 9 a.m.? Yes, Your Honor. All right. Uh, thank you very much. With no other matters to, to, to be tackled, uh, this hearing is now adjourned. Thank you.